He's in Disney World. Yeah. Oh, that's Disneyland. Right. I'm yep. sorry. Yep. I was just yep. kidding about taking your con bar. I know you were. <laughs> I got it right now. I know are my favorite, though. All right, 9 o'clock, let's get this show on the road. Michael? All right, thank you, uh, Mayor, Council. Um, List of questions here. Today's uh, budget workshop is really a presentation from staff and a direct discussion with staff and Council regarding the upcoming budget. Um, although we, we have some folks in the, in the audience, many of them are staff, and they'll be uh, talking with you here. We don't have public comment or any sort of um, public interaction that goes on at these meetings. This is really just for staff and council to go and work on the budget and talk through the budget aspects. A um, couple of things that I want to make uh, known to you at the very beginning. Um, we have been working diligently on trying to improve our budget process. It's not something that you see a whole lot of, but the staff sees it on the back end. Um, up until this point, we have been taking information from our uh, financial system, exporting it and putting it into Excel spreadsheets and doing all kinds of uh, calculations and things with it. Um, this year, our financial system came back and said, okay, we got a product we want you to try that does that for you. It's helped out uh, immensely in keeping information all in one location and making sure that we're able to track as much information as we want. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to show you a little bit of some of the information that we have in this system. I made mention at the last council meeting that I have plenty of information for you and that um, what we show you here today may only be the tip of the iceberg, but I wanted to show you a little bit more about what some of the details look like and what level of information our staff goes to when they put together a budget. Michael, before you begin, while, sure. while, while today's meeting is not structured for public comment, there will be um, a budget, there'll be a budget meeting later in May where it's yes, open our, to public comment. Just yes, so. we have uh, scheduled a public hearing for the budget where anybody from the town can get up and speak about the budget put out any concerns that they have or make any statements that they you know they want to have this or they don't like that right. so yes that happens on may 8th is the next council meeting great so um what you can see on the screen and what's on the screens in front of you is sort of the back end of our budget software um, i bring this up because um, this is the parks and rec budget right here and you can see that um, it has a lot of uh, data from previous years, uh, what we spent to date, our current budget to date in the existing year. It gives us a four-year average of what the budget typically looks like. Um, and then we have our initial budget, which is where the staff put in all of their information and make their recommendations on, on uh, the systems and the, and the budgets that they're looking for. One of the things that will jump out at you is that there's these little blue tick marks in the corner of the initial budget. What that means is there's additional information behind that. So that number is made up of something. And I'll give you an example. All of the personnel and benefits information is controlled by the HR director and myself. So the staff can't touch those. So if staff wants to delete a position, or wants to add a position or wants to upgrade a position they come to me and say okay this is what we want to do and give me justification and then I put it in the back end but basically what happens is when you click on this button it shows you the wage detail spreadsheet that goes on behind all of this work um, it tells you information on the individual uh, what position they are whether they're full-time seasonal their pay rates and so forth um, how long they've been here, their hire dates and so forth. As you go down through the spreadsheet, a lot of this builds on itself and creates a total budget file for personnel and benefits. Give you a good example of that. I have placed in here a COLA percentage of 
um, and I have a merit percentage in here of 2%. Now originally I had started out the budget by saying I was not going to give a COLA, but I was going to give up to a 3% merit. And that is if you perform well enough, you could get up to 3% for that year. Comparing ourselves with other communities in the area and doing some benchmarking, I found that majority of them were giving some level of COLA. And I didn't want our staff to backslide compared to other communities in their salary. So I sort of switched it on and off a little bit. I put in a 2% COLA and dropped the merit down to 2%. Um, that calculates off of all the base information beforehand and it tells us how we need to go and uh, budget for those items in this particular budget. And you just keep going on down there. We budget for overtime for various people, special events, on call, longevity payments. That's all based in here. Um, and that's a big change that you'll see in everybody's budget this year. Uh, before, we our, our financial system was limited to only being able to capture longevity payments out of one account and that was our HR account. Well now with the new system I'm able to go and show longevity per employee and it shows up in this. So where last year we had I believe it was like $35,000 of longevity payment that was all in the HR budget. This year it'll be spread out through all the organization in the individual budgets. So there's a lot of information that goes into this. It calculates out our FICA, our, our uh, retirement, any of our LEO retirement accounts and so on. Uh, all the way down to medical insurance and workers comp. And that's done on a per person basis. So this information is readily available to staff when they look at it and they can see okay, um, maybe somebody wants to upgrade this position to something else, then that would cost us X. And when I put that in, it calculates out all the percentages and everything. So there's a lot of background information in here on the personnel and benefits. Along those same lines, we have our maintenance and operations section. And you see in, in uh, uh, Eric's budget, there are a lot of those blue tick marks. And basically, when I click on those blue tick marks, it shows you what makes up that $43,500 cost in contracted services. Well, he has basketball referee contract that costs him $9,000. He has cardio equipment contract, which is $15,000. He's got instructor contract payments for all the uh, fitness instructors that we uh, have come in. And that's uh, 19.5. So all of those added up comes up to the total of 43.5. Now, what you'll hear from staff today and in future um, uh, workshops is they're probably going to talk to you about general parameters of the budget. I highly doubt that that uh, Eric is going to say, "Okay, for my contract services, I'm asking for 43.5, and here is what makes up that." but that information is there for you if you are interested in it. Um, I haven't found a good way to export that, those individual backup documentations into a format that I can give to you so USB you drive. have it, but if there are questions related to that, you can always ask and know that if there's something in those tick boxes, it's additional information that we have. Does that make sense? Um, as you go down into the capital improvements, you'll see um, there's $271,000 worth of capital improvements. One thing to know about our capital improvements, we have accounting standards that we have to go by through the state um, for what is a capital item, and a capital item is any one product that is $5,000 or more. When that happens, we have to put that on our asset list so that we show assets and liabilities correctly from a governmental standpoint, but we report it very much like you would a regular business. Um, so if we buy a new piece of equipment that is more than $5,000, 
if we replace an existing piece of equipment that's more than five thousand dollars then we will put it into the capital projects line item Michael real quickly yes sir do those automatically we roll over to our insurance policy and our tracking for our um, FEMA stuff that we need to have and what's that guy that holds our town liability I mean our um, uh, insurance policy for it doesn't automatically do it, but yes, Are, we keep there track. Is some process that annually we're yes, adding everything? We, we keep track of that. Actually, Kim is the one that handles all the insurance policies, making sure that we have tags as Craig and pointed out, and As Craig pointed out yesterday, I'm sure we're storing that all within a block of the beach to be credited for. Right. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. Yes, sir. Um, but just, just curious where you go on. Um, and Eric's going to do this presentation? Yes. Okay, so are we going to see these numbers during his presentation? Yes. Okay. I'm just trying to give you a, a background of what the software does and why I keep saying I have more information than you could possibly need. Um, and if you see any of these tick marks on any of the documents and so forth, you can always ask, hey, what's made up of this number? And I should be able to provide you with that extra detail. So. Not only do we have capital um, products such as replacement of vehicles or new vehicles, equipment, things like that, that are $5,000 or more in this line item, we also have projects in this line item. So for instance, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit, I'm sure Eric will get into this a little bit more, the training room uh, rec center improvements are $20,000 that he's suggesting. Well, what are those improvements? And he'll tell you a little bit about what those improvements are, but what that is is it is Im improvements to the entire recreation center. So that changes how much we have put towards our asset, the recreation <coughs> center. So projects, even if they're small projects, may end up being in the capital project lines because they improve our assets on our asset uh, register. So that gives you kind of an idea of how much background information goes into this budget process. Um, from a functional standpoint, staff starts out with a zero-based budget. They say, okay, I'm building my budget for this year. How much is it going to take? Um, then they go back through and make sure that all of their fixed uh, uh, accounts are taken care of, electricity, things of that nature, and then they move on to variables, which are things like travel and training and so forth, where they can say, okay, I want to send four people to this type of a training for this year. And that's how they build their budget every year. We typically use that information and compare it to previous years just to make sure that uh, there isn't anything that is significantly uh, out of whack, so to speak, in the budget process. So that's sort of an overview of how we handle the budget and the um, budget software. Are there any specific questions regarding that? I'm going to leave this in the background up so as Eric talks, if all of a sudden you guys look in your sheets and say, oh, he didn't say anything about this, but what's in this, that you can ask and we should be able to pull up the information. All right, I either blew you away. I like the four-year average. I like that four-year average. I was saving my questions for Eric. All right, good. That that sounds great because I'm not supposed to be the one talking here. The uh, department <laughs> heads are. So I'm going to pull up Eric's presentation. You have a copy of this presentation in front of you um, in printed form. It's your baby, Eric. All right, Mayor, Council, thank you for the opportunity to present the proposed uh, Parks and Rec budget for 2018-2019. If you could just take that capital um, expenditure, that 270000 just erase that from your minds for now. Don't think about that, but we go into the rest of this. Um, so I'd like to give like a little bit of overview, basically, uh, on Parks and Rec, um, our accomplishments for the last year. Dive into some of the numbers that we're looking at uh, as far as revenue. Uh, recapture rate and all that but basically the mission of the town of Carolina Beach Parks and Rec Department is to provide an excellent variety of leisure opportunities to enhance the individual's quality of life through exceptional programs and attractive safe and well-maintained parks and facilities and that's a beautiful shot of uh, the farmers market so we're gonna go with the department overview some accomplishments and then we'll dive into our proposed budget uh, so some of the accomplishments that we are uh, have completed for this last fiscal year 
is our new youth lounge um, at the rec center is opened. Um, the help center was able to be relocated and we opened up that space and it's been used a lot. We've uh, installed new lockers in the men's and women's rooms. We added new weight equipment. Uh, we were able to install brand new LED lights in our gym. Uh, very energy efficient with a huge uh, rebate through D Duke Energy. Uh, and we're also in the process right now of in installing uh, brand new uh, basketball equipment, um, backboards and some electric winches so we don't have to do it by hand drill. Uh, and that's replacing aging 20 plus year equipment. Uh, Mike Chapel Park, we were able to do a ton of uh, work over at our skate park and get that up to um, par. Uh, we added some safety netting on the baseball field, uh, new picnic tables, athletic benches. We resurfaced our basketball court. Uh, we added additional pickleball courts at Mike Chapel Park, which are very popular. And uh, we are getting to ready to replace some playground um, items, specifically the swing set and the um, uh, seesaw over at Mike Chapel Park as well. And the biggest thing is is that we took all the information from our community that filled out our survey and we were able to uh, get the 2017-22 Parks and Recreation Master Plan approved uh, in October of 2017. And I really believe that this budget is community driven and reflects the input that we received through that process. Uh, and, then also, and then also we've had uh, tons of successful programs this, this past year. Uh, with the addition of the family night, and we did Friday night, and we're taking over Christmas Island Sea, summer camp, and all that good stuff as well. So when we're looking at our revenue comparison, and basically this is just letting you all know that, yeah, the Parks and Rec budget in the last four or five years has gone up, but so is our revenue. And I think that just goes to show that we're trying to be really good stewards of uh, town finances. So um, it continues to trend up, and as of right now, well, as of April 2nd, we were 13.6% uh, increase over last year. I think the overall projection is going to be close to 200000 at the end of this fiscal year. So that's quite a jump from back in 12, 13. And then looking at the recapture rate. So basically, like, uh, if you take a national average of a parks and rec department, we're quality of life, right? So every community wants to be able to provide parks, they want to be able to provide programs, they want people to enjoy the community. But I think it's also important to make sure that we're recapturing some of those fees. So a national average is about 25%, and we're, re we're, we're there, we met that. And um, I feel comfortable about that. Uh, if you take, and, and that's really with one, re one revenue producing facility, which is our recreation center. Uh, the parks don't produce as much revenue outside of special events and stuff. But um, this is showing again that you know our revenue, our budget has increased, but so has the uh, recapture rate. Question for you. Yeah. Huge jump between 13, 14, and 14, 15 in revenue there. Yeah. Is that from the rec center being cleaned up? and? Yeah, I think up? that's when I was hired. Um, <laughs> Would you say? <laughs> that was when I was hired. Yeah. Good one. <laughs> um, so, in, so in 13, 14 is when we, when we finally put together a plan to renovate the facility. <laughs> and so we redid the weight room. We did, redid our cardio. We got it up to par. Um, but with that, we were able to justify increased rates. So the rates for the recreation center increased, but so did the membership. Okay. So that's why you'll see that big, that big jump there. And then we also added a lot of different programs. Uh, we redid how we did our contract instructors. Uh, well, we're collecting that money now. So in that line item, I saw that you, you saw that 19.5. Mm -hmm. That's all money that we collect. Okay. But I have to budget that because we pay it out as well to our instructors. That makes sense. Eric, how do you want us to ask questions? Per slide, or because yeah, I'm going to forget. No, you fire away. Okay, so I just I, I, I just have a question. When you did the LED lights, did you use the Duke Incentive Program? Correct. And you got yes. them all for free. We did not get them all for free, but it was like 75 percent or something. Okay. I mean, right, the lights right. were like 20 grand, and we right. pay like five for it. Okay. Roughly. Great. And um, the the improvements you're going to do at Mike Chuckle Park, do you have to go through Matsu to get improvement, uh, get a permission for those improvements? Yes. And are you doing that or have done it? Or? Yeah. So like a lot of the big stuff, we will if we're adding anything new. But if we're maintaining, okay. I don't. I mean, if it's maintaining, it's, if it's if it's public safety wise, and it's just you know fixing. That's all the pickleball courts, and I'm assuming that'll have to have permission or not. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything where we have current. Um, programs out there and current assets they've all been approved by Matsu at some point in time 
Um, anytime where we add something new to the facility, yes, uh, Eric sends it to me. I send a, a letter to the colonel and request permission. Usually it takes a couple of weeks and we get that permission back. Um, last one I think we did was the uh, in the dog park we had a uh, uh, shade, structure. shade structure that went up okay. and we did that. And are you doing that just by mail, or are you also following up with email? I mean, you know, a lot of times we, they say the mail got lost. Or... We're, we're doing both. Okay, perfect. And then typically it's passed from the colonel down to their um, uh, public works person, uh, Mike Fuller, and we deal directly with Mike on, on most of those items. Okay. Thank you. So this is our rec center numbers. Dive into that. Um, it just shows the increase in the recreation center memberships. Um, just to show, basically showing that we have an increase in memberships throughout the year. Still working on our uh, rec desk software to actually um, dive in and, and break down resident, non-resident fees, and I'm working on that. But this is additional membership breakdown of resident versus non-resident. So you can see that roughly 70% of the uh, memberships of the rec center are residents and 31% are non-residents. Um, and this fluctuates. This fluctuates anywhere from like 1700 to like 2100 active members. It all depends on when they... When Is they this on the screen membership. or can you remind me what the fees are now? Yes. So the fees are um, $80 for an adult resident, $140 for a non-resident, $160 for a family resident, 240 for a non-family resident, 50 for a senior resident, 100 for a non-resident senior. The same for you. Is that good? Okay, great. All right, so this is the Parks and Rec proposed budget. The overall, the, the, the highlights and, you know, taking our personnel and benefits and maintenance and operations. Total budget of $954,559. So it's a big number. It's um, a community-driven budget. A lot of this is going into projects um, that we'll get into, but I want to let you know that, that that number is big to us, right? But it is 6% of our overall budget, town budget. 6% of the town's overall budget? Correct. Proposed Are you going to go over those numbers, what's in them? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to dive into the highlights right now. And the first one, the first big expenditure right now is going to be Ryder, Lewis, and Jerry is here and he's um, taking the project manager lead on this project and is doing an awesome job um, getting it to where it's where it's been. Uh, we do need more funding to get it open. Currently we uh, have to cross a wetland area which is right there so we need a bridge. Uh, we have a parking lot that is completed. We have a retaining wall that's put in. All the stone trail from here to up around here is all installed. We got the uh, easement, thanks to Jerry, through, for the Dollar General. And we have to put crusher on there. And then this all is boardwalk. So this is future funding that we have to get to cross over. Uh, <clears throat> so the one thing that we need to get this park open is the bridge. So without a bridge, we can't, we can't get there. Currently, we have some steel plates down and the contractor is going to request those to be removed um, at some point. Is that all phase one you're showing us? This is phase one, okay. yes. So there's options to break phase one into phase 1A, 1B, 1C, and how, how we want to see it produced. But this is phase one. This is a complete uh, loop of the Sugarloaf Earthworks. Um, this is the entire conceptual plan. So this would be phase this is phase two, Jerry, right? Yeah. Phase two, um, elevated boardwalk through some of the wetland area, and then phase three would loop it back. Um, so we're concentrating on trying to get phase, phase one completed, specifically get that bridge in at a minimum to be able to open the park and hold a ribbon cutting. Does phase one include a walking trail? Yes. And, and what's the distance of that? Oh, the About. distance of the full loop is third of a mile yeah okay. it's not all three all three, all three. It, the just phase one though is probably about a third I guess of a mile I'd say 
So um, our funding options available is if we want to complete all of it, right? If we want to um, finish the entire trail, put in all the boardwalk, do the entire loop, um, we're looking at roughly $106,000. That's just for phase one. This is just phase one. Yes. Out of three phase, phases? Pardon? And yes. Yes. What's the difference between your 83000 that I saw in your budget and the one hundred six? Okay. So we had uh, my initial meeting with, uh, with Mr. Kramer was prior to our meeting at Ryder Lewis Park where we really kind of like dove down into it. So the eighty three six was the estimated completion for um, – getting the uh, bridge in and then potentially doing the crossovers. What we forgot to add in then is some of the, like, the amenities, um, the additional travel around the gravel around the trail, um, and some of the slope down uh, to, to the boardwalk. So I feel comfortable at the 83.6 to be able to get the project going. Uh, we can always look at funding elsewhere through the History Center. Um, but I just wanted to let you all know, uh, break it down as options. And then the third option is 65000 and that's roughly to finish our parking lot, finish the grading of the Dollar General easement, and then also to um, get the bridge installed. And at that point, what we can do is not have a completed loop trail, but have a nice schematic sign at the, at the ends of the trail um, showing the future of what it couldn't look like and then ways that uh, the community can get involved and fundraise and um, visit the History Center to learn more about the project. Okay. And then uh, as far as uh, timeline, this is the timeline that, uh, that Jerry put together, um, depending on funding, but we're looking at hopefully, ideally having uh, a ribbon cutting sometime in October, November. The user area, is that a place that we could uh, ultimately maybe make revenue on that people could rent out for parties, barbecues? Or is that it's it's possible. I mean, we have, uh, we do have, uh, we do rent out the Lake Park Shelter and we rent out Mike Chapel Shelter and we could potentially put something there and rent it out um, as a possibility as well, yeah. If council remembers, this has been kind of a work in progress. Um, once the property was donated to the town, uh, we worked with the History Center uh, and a subgroup to come up with the concepts and, and what needed to be done. A lot of the uh, concept drawings and engineering were donated to us um, uh, by the uh, consultants um, or were paid at a very reduced rate to get the project moving along. Um, once we did that this past year, or this current year, um, we talked about uh, trying to get the project moving and jump start it um, and that's where we came to council asked for approximately sixty five thousand dollars and that was to put in the um, the parking lot do some of the stormwater stuff there put in some of the trail aspects that got us right up to the wetlands it's where the wetlands meet our trails that we want to put in that become the difficult part and we've now gotten to that point and that's what this next step is is if we want to go past the wetlands and make it so it's an actual usable park um, there's those three options to, to consider budgeting for do you want to add anything good all right so uh, another um, this is a line item in professional services that I wanted to talk about and this is really um, going on the uh, what the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee has been working on and what they would like to see done. Uh, when we're looking at our master plan, um, and I know you all heard Duke talk at the April meeting, but you know uh, the the most used facility in Carolina Beach is 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 the Lake Park, and so the committee wanted to look at ways of improving Lake Park. How do we make it more user friendly? How do we able are we able to provide amenities that are within the master plan at Lake Park? Um, now that you know, we know that it's one of the most used facilities and people use it, can we make it better? So one way of doing that is by fine tuning the master plan uh, through some professional design work. Uh, and I did receive a very initial uh, budget 
uh, for being able to host, um, have a professional design company come in and, and, and give us some detailed drawings of, of what we can do. Um, so this is kind of how that concept would play out. Uh, it's nothing that would be implemented immediately. It would have a ton of community involvement, a lot of public meetings, um, and then you know attaching costs to that. But it's something that the, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee feels very uh, passionate about it, so do I, and I've, I really do believe that it fits well within our master plan. And so the design work for that is roughly $30,000. Um, and that's also Lake Park and then also looking at Mike Chapel Park in ways that we could potentially um, clean up our maintenance area and make it more attractive, um, make it more functional, make it more useful. And then the $80,000 in that is seed money to be able to get the projects going. As you know, currently we do not have a playground at Lake Park. That playground was unsafe. Um, it was dangerous and it really needed to be removed. So we, were able, we, we took it out, we put some sod down um, to make the area look good for the season. But uh, it's something that the community is definitely probably going to want and, uh, and you may hear about. Um, so we wanted to be able to have a little bit of money in there. So when we do have a plan in place that we can show the community um, that we're serious about this, that we're listening to them, and that we can move forward with some of the projects. So council, just to give you a, a, a little bit more information on that, where I was showing you the tick marks in our system, this is where this comes in very useful. Uh, the amount of $30,000 is actually in the Parks and Recreation Professional Services line item, whereas the 80000 development uh, funds are for the playground, which is a capital asset item that is in the capital portion of his budget. So it's not all just lumped together as one big project because it could span over multiple different projects for both design and construction. Well, so like for instance, does the playground equipment um, have a top priority versus something else? I guess that's in your 80000 Yeah, that's what, you know, I put in the 80000 roughly for a for playground, but I think it's, it's important to listen to our community and, and see what it is. It might be something completely different based upon public input. Okay. But I think it is important that we got to put we we have to put something back. I do there, think right? people use that quite often. Yes. When I was there, there oh, yeah, was always yeah. kids on it. Yeah, it's definitely. And it was old. You're it, right. And and, and I think <laughs> like um, you know eighty thousand dollars is is a big number, right? Um, it's a big number to us. But I think that when we look at Lake Park, that's our flagship. That is that's that's a defining amenity for Carolina Beach. And I think that if we put something there, we could you know customize it to to Car the flavor of Carolina Beach. You mean sense. something else like, like a, if we did a playground, like or something like that, and customize it, splash make it or well, something I know like when that. They looked at doing Mike Chapel Park before. They had a bunch of volunteers, and and they got together, and they had a concept of maybe doing a big um, pirate ship instead of a traditional off-the-shelf mm -hmm. playground. Mm -hmm. So when they talk about customizing, it, maybe it's you know some um, sea creatures or some kind of play mm -hmm. structure that is more beach accented oh, yeah. than a mm -hmm. um, off-the-shelf. Sl swing and a slide. Swing and a slide. They had a, yeah, a pirate ship with slides and climbing ropes. And splash pad. <laughs> splash pad wasn't splash really pad. in there. Um, yeah, I mean, at least in the last concept. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I got you. So, so really, the, I was just guy. thinking the same thing. That's right. me, bro. Yeah, yeah, they have so it is the amazing guy. ideas when we at that meeting. I do okay. think that's a good space, and and the kids love that. So I. I I, I like that. Yeah, and um, so going into that, this is this is the fun that we have at our Parks and Recreation Advisory I Committee, mentioned. where we dream. We dream about what the parks can look like, and we mark up stuff. And this is uh, this was one of the brainstorming ideas that we had. And um, let's see, as you as you can see, like right here, we kind of just got rid of this ditch and kind of made it change the parking around a little bit and. These are just ideas that the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, our citizens, come up with. Um, and, uh, and you know, whether or not it's reality, I don't know. I don't, I'm not an engineer. I don't have that background. But that's, that's what we want to see. Like, how, how can we get our community input and attach some numbers to it and feasibility-wise? So, um, and this is the playground. This is where the playground was. And, as you can see, I will tell you, I get asked every day, what's for kids to do here? <laughs> I brought my kids. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, yes. 
Um, so it looks nice, but you know, there used to be a playground there. And then this is the other area that we wanted to kind of clean up. Um, I just, uh, this is Mike Chapel Park, and this is our park area. Um, you know, we have the two trailers. It just, it just doesn't look right. Um, and we kind of want to see if there, you know, there's a lot of residential, there's a lot of houses around that park, and we want to make sure that, um, that we have things looking nice, um, well kept. Uh, so we kind of wanted to put some preliminary design to see what it would take to make this functional, useful, and um, better looking, I guess. Uh, going into the recreation center, uh, in the past f three, four years, we've renovated pretty much every room possible, um, except the old youth lounge. The old youth lounge um, was a small area. Uh, when we redid some of our, uh, uh, the weight room, we moved some of the old equipment in there. Um, there's been some discussion amongst some of our members and instructors about uh, creating a training room in there, a functional training room. Uh, something that's similar to like, uh, like a Spartan type training facility, I guess you could say. Um, so this is just one design that we came up with. Um, again, it is, this is something that we, we would engage the community on. Um, there's lots of ideas that came across from you know virtual rock climbing um, systems to something like this. But uh, you know it's 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 one room that's not used that well, um, and being able to retrofit it and create uh, a usable space there. And um, moving on, another project that we would like to see happen is uh, expansion of the Parks and Recreation Maintenance Shop storage area that is in the back of uh, the Recreation Center. Uh, currently, we house all of our beach wheelchairs in there in the season. Um, our wheelchair fleet, the beach wheelchair fleet, has increased. Thank you to Island Women and um, many people that donate chairs. Uh, we just had a person in Charlotte that donated one to us. Um, but we want to be able to house these in a, in, a, in, a, a, in a way that we make sure that they're maintained well and we take care of them. So um, we don't have adequate storage right now for all of our uh, park maintenance equipment um, and also the beach wheelchairs. So the addition is uh, to be able to house the beach wheelchairs and then also the bike rodeo supplies. We would be able to move that um, old shed out of there, clean that area up, do some landscaping. And then ideally what I see, have in vision is a nice sign that says beach wheelchair pick up and drop off, maybe a button that they can press. So you're removing the shed, what are you spending 35 grand on, building a new building structure? A, building a 24 by 20 addition to that maintenance shop. And this is a, this again. Th th I mean, this will be bitted out. Um, this was two, two quotes that I got. But I'm, we could probably get it cheaper. But yeah, and that house. So the house will house all of our um, beach wheelchair. The CBD. Uh, the bike radio that that all of their stuff is in that shed right now. So has he asked to contribute on his budget? For <laughs> no, we're just going to lease them the space. Good idea. <laughs> Keep, keep in mind the area that we're talking about is directly behind the rec center. Uh, behind the rec center there is a small uh, metal shed building that was put up originally as a sign shop. We've converted it over and Parks and Rec has been using it as their maintenance area. And then in between that shed and the actual rec department uh, building um, there are small uh, 10 by 10, 12 by 12 sheds that we've housed equipment and things in. Basically what Eric's talking about is g bridging the two, connecting the, uh, the old uh, metal shed to the building and filling that area in so that they could uh, house the beach wheelchairs and the bike rodeo stuff and have an access point where people can come get the beach wheelchairs and that they'd be clean and safe and ready for them to use. I mean, it's amazing how much their beach wheelchairs are used. Um, it's really, it's really an awesome program. And yeah, that's it. We just want to make sure that we keep them in good working order and that people have access to them and for pickup, drop off, um, and then have a nice little wash down station there. Really highlight the program uh, and make it a little bit better. 
Uh, and then going into uh, ve parts and rec vehicle replacement, those are our we have two vehicles. We have a tractor. Well, we have three. We have a tractor, <laughs> we have a gator, and we have a truck. And uh, currently, our parks and recreation vehicle is um, it's running. It's working. We have a rusted out bed. We were able to put some plywood down, marine grain plywood, to make it safe. Um, you know, but it's something that we want to look at. We don't have any take-home vehicles, so we'd be fine with something used. I just I'm I'm purely looking at safety. Um, the other thing is a uh, is um, a tractor. Right now, we have a tractor at uh, Mike Chapel Park. Um, there's the old one. Sometimes I'm able to drive it, um, but. Uh, that's a 1989 and it cranks and it works sort of uh, but you know we have youth leagues coming in there and we got to turn the field and um, you know we don't I, when, I, when I was looking at replacing equipment to turn it ball, ball field infield I wanted to be a little bit more um, uh, you know I wanted I wanted a piece of equipment that could do more than just turn infield so we looked at the uh, utility tractor and that'll help us be able to move mulch move sand move Equipment it will help with maintenance on the. So um, you're asking for both of those. Correct. Yeah. All right. It will add uh, uh, maintenance on the greenway. Um, other town departments can utilize it. It just it, it will do more than just some a piece of equipment. Your vehicle turn. is a truck. It right is. Now. Yeah, it's a truck. Yeah, it's a 2004. Um, it it works. It's fine. It's it just the, the rusted out bed scares me a little. So, and I gotta end with some pictures because sorry for stepping out, but yeah. can you um you said you need both of these pieces and they're not just for parks and rec? And where would you store them? So so that's so, so the vehicle the vehicle is um replacing the truck that Margaret uses. I got gotcha. Um the tractor is replacing the tractor that is at Mike Chapel Park right now. Storage um is something that we have to look into. Uh, obviously, we want to store this thing indoors, so we're actually going <coughs> to set up a demo, and we're going to clean out one of the um, cargo trailers there and see if we can fit it inside there. If not, we can be able to get some sort of temporary shelter. Um, you know, it's it's used all the time, and my fear is that if it breaks down, then we're kind of like scrambling. So I want to. I, I think it's important to put this in the budget to make sure that we have replacement if needed. One of the things to keep in mind about the equipment for Parks and Rec, quite often we use other town equipment to help them maintain the ball fields and, um, and their assets at Mike Chapel Park, for instance. If we put down mulch, well, they don't have the ability to put down mulch, so we end up using one of our backhoes. Well, it's not like we have a backhoe sitting around waiting f with nothing to do. Um, so we end up having to go and put other projects off because of that. Uh, this tractor, with that type of thing, Eric could be self-contained and be able to do his own Is thing. Is that why you're asking for the bucket? That's the only reason I could see you would need the bucket. The, the bucket, the uh, edging, the field turner, all of the equipment that goes along with the tractor is what will make... Uh, parks and Rec much more self-sufficient in dealing with that operation. I mean, I've seen 20, 30-year-old tractors still running. So I Guaranteed. You can, oh, yeah. you can definitely do that. Um, it is harder in the area that we're talking about just because of the size of it and what you're trying to do with it, but that's part of where Eric's interest is, is trying to make it so we can maintain it in a more efficient, effective yeah, I mean, manner. Yeah, I mean, a variety of the departments have asked for new vehicles. Is there one that, um, I mean, would, would still be a hand-me-down, but would be an upgrade from a rusted-out bed that we could? Not exactly. And we've looked at some of that over the years. We've hand-me-downed a lot of vehicles. Um, quite a few of the trucks that we use right now are operations and uh, police department, and they're ones that are out in the sand. And when they go, they go. It is the not the bed, it is the chassis, it is the engine, it is the transmission that's going in those vehicles. So they're really not appropriate for hand-me-down type vehicles. We've looked at that in this year's fleet. Um, that's why what Eric's suggesting here is that we can go out and get a used um, truck uh, to go and replace this vehicle instead of buying a full new 
$40,000 vehicle. Hold my questions. Oh, I got another. Is that, I was going to let Eric finish. I got pictures. I like that. I got to add pictures. And That's then. That's a feel-good presentation. I'm <laughs> trying to. <laughs> trying to end it on a positive note. Eric, I generally, um, we've talked in the past. T tell me what revenue generate a percentage I mean nationwide parks and recs never break even they never make they generally don't make money except for maybe Myrtle Beach um, you've increased the revenues up to almost 200,000 I mean typically what percentage of revenues would a parks and recs department generate versus their budget so if I look at NRPA which is the National Recreation and Park Association a ballpark figure uh, on a national scale is about 25 percent mm. so in fairness to you if we took out, um, you, you know, you're, you're at uh, 950 on the total budget, and if we took out the um, extraordinary capital improvements, you, you know, you're at 700, so you're hitting 200 in income. You're pretty close to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I want to point out is I think he's done a great job increasing revenues over the past couple of years. Do you project with the needs at uh, Ryder Lewis that that 271 in capital um, improvements is going to be a consistent number for the next couple of years or do you think we'll be backing it off a little bit more towards you know we've been 65 um, the previous year the year before that we just ba barely gave you seventy five hundred dollars I mean can we get it back down to 150 in the future oh yeah think? and ultimately ultimately what the, what it's going to be based on is um, you know the wishes of council moving forward with Ryder Lewis you know phase two phase three those are big price tags you know, well, and we've been working with Ryder Lewis on generating some other revenues, and there's some opportunities. It's just a matter, and um, uh, Councilwoman Pierce and I are talking to Susie Hamilton about that. There's some other opportunities to help offset that, but it, it's an anomaly at 270 on your CIP. Is, is, is that a fair statement? Yes. Yeah. And to, to look at um, Eric's capital budget, um, really what you're talking about here is the products that a plan will provide and that's something that we haven't done before um, previously we had recreation programs and we focused on upgrading those recreation programs uh, the backboards the pickleball courts those types of activities so we've spent probably the past four years in improving the actual functioning of the rec center um, the next step with this master plan and with design plans and things like that is to develop what your future capital plans will look like for the entire town. Um, what we haven't done before is we've never gone out and did bonds or loans for just parks and rec. So when you do the plans and you're able to scale that out and decide, okay, this is how we'd like to approach it, then you can put those more into capital project type planning aspects. Um, so, so far to date, we have basically just been upgrading what we existing have. And this is just the first Savo into additional programs. And that's all determined by council and by the public. So I would point out that, you know, you've been able, we, last year we spent money on buildings, equipment, and grounds. And this year's proposed budget, you've, you've cut that back by 50 grand because we've done some, I mean, it's kind of like our utilities deal. We didn't spend a lot of money over the past you on know, maintaining it, what we had, so we had to put a big chunk in this past year. So, uh, you know, I mean, he, we, we, he's got was, three sections. Was we was got, last, year? Uh, last year was 770, 775, so he's up, you know, 170,000, but it's all in capital that. improvements. Uh, and that was, I mean, he's, 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 he, I mean, you know, the personnel, it's a negligible increase, and he's dropped 50 on mm. maintenance and operations. It's all in capital, uh, which is what I think Michael's trying to point out. Which is us. kind of where my questions are. And let me just say this. I think it's, you're, you guys are doing a phenomenal job. I go over there, and I see citizens that I know working out in the weight room. I see kids in there. A little fellow opens the door for me, and they're hanging out in the little – they don't have anywhere to go after school. That's why they're hanging out up there. They're playing. They're in there playing basketball. They're in there with the game. Great. Good, mm -hmm. good job. I do have a question about the equipment. Just from my, my point of view, I mean, my, my question is, how many miles are on the vehicle you have now that you want to replace with 27,000? Uh, 70,000. 
So, and that's not a lot of miles. So it's not a lot of mileage. It's, you don't go not, very far it's, on it's this not, island. And, and look, I'm the last person to know anything about vehicles. I don't. I don't really. I'm not a vehicle kind of guy. I just know that if I step in a bed, I don't want my foot to go through this giant uh, hole. And are you saying it's rusted out? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. That's the only concern. We put plywood on it just yeah. to hold we it We put up. some marine grade plywood, plywood on it. And, and, and what if kind it of passes vehicle inspection, you, we'll keep rolling I got you. It. What kind of vehicle are you proposing at $27,000? Um, so 27000 was your... A brand uh, new something. It was a brand new oh, well, uh, Ford F-150, basically off a of state contract. Let me, let me try and, and, but, and make sure that we're talking about the correct numbers. The twenty-five thousand dollars that was shown to you on his slide is the tractor. Yeah, I hadn't got to right, the tractor yet. Yeah. I'm talking about twenty-seven on the, the truck. The the truck is twenty th or is twenty-seven thousand dollars, and that is just bare bones used type. But do truck. we need a do we need a brand new F one fifty? Yeah, I'm looking at a used it F one fifty for twenty-three grand vehicle. Perfect. Or how much to replace just the bed? And, I'm just so. I'm a, I understand but if yes. you say that, that it's rusted out, because I, I live here at the beach, too. I get it. I mean, but I'm not sure a brand-new vehicle to drive three miles around the island is what I, we're I, looking for. I, I agree with you. So I agree I, with you on that. I would be more inclined in the future on those discussions to go back and say, management, you can come up with a vehicle. You need to you need to do the most cost-effective. And, and so I'm hoping that Michael can find a used truck for under $27,000 that meets Eric's needs. Um, so Eric you know just wants it to pass. Right. Oh, I'd do. rather see <laughs> that money go, go towards... And what I'm also I talk, hearing I, is I've that, talked uh, to uh, I talked to Gil and he's he's in charge of our fleet maintenance and you know he just kind of took a look. We at have a it. huge fleet. And yeah, so he's he it you know he, he's he's got ways to make it to make it work. You know, there's okay, there's so ways that we can do. I got you. The so, thing is, my so look my, for concern, a cheaper truck. my concern Sorry. is that if all of a sudden in you know four months the truck doesn't work and I don't have any money budgeted, I just it's, it's it's a tough thing to work. So it's, for me, on out. these budgets, it's no different than what he was asking for the thirty grand for the parks design at Lake Park and eighty grand for the fixtures. Until he has that budget, he's saying this is my budget. It's their job to come in under that number, and then Michael's going to have some carry. I get all dollars. that, but what I'm saying is every year the budget increases, I and agree. that's because we and we it bump will. it. Up. Well, let me finish. We bump <laughs> it up to cover that, but we never bump it back down. Because we didn't use it. We always find another place to use it. I'm not saying I'm dissatisfied with yeah. anything, but yeah. and when you look at this proposed this picture of the utility tractor, I'm not, I'm not being rude or anything, but that's a glorified lawnmower. That's not a full-size tractor with a bush hog and, and a rake no, and, you know, you know. Well, I mean, it's but it's not a... The, it's to do the field maintenance. I got you, but... You, it's not a full-size tractor. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think you'll have more. Pro I mean, I'm not. I'm not telling you what to buy. I'm not the John Deere expert, but I, I, did, I know a little bit about tractors, and it, it, you would have more trouble with that probably than a full-size tractor. This is my personal opinion. You know, and I don't know what Michael has looked at. Um, well, hello, Michael. I don't know. What, I mean, have you looked at anything else, or is that the only thing you've looked at? That's just a graphical representation of so the, it's types, not the, vehicle. the types of tractors that we have been looking at. We've looked at various different tractors. Um, for the Parks and Rec Department, there is no need for a large tractor um, because we have to get into tight, confined spaces. So really, we're looking much more at a mini-type tra right. tractor but one that has enough attachments and things that we can do various types of job or things. So, yes, ma'am, it does. Right. Um, and my other question um, is about your weight room. Do you have um, area? I don't even know because I look at it from the inside, but is there any area to expand? There isn't. Because cause you, you've got that whole wall there. The wall. There's, there's nothing on the other side of that gym. Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah there's parking. And then there's in the back. It's. Um, I do see that you packed. Yeah. Used a lot. A lot of weight. Well, I mean, yeah, it's used a lot. Right, and I see a lot of uh, yeah. citizens. I see employees. I see everybody over there. So I think that's really a good, um, healthy thing for our community at a very low price for them to be able to go and work out and stay healthy. And those are good things. That just seems like to me you're going to outgrow that spot. How yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> We'll work with it. Though. And that's we'll what I was thinking about yeah, the yeah. 20000 that you that you were talking about putting in the little small room over yes. on the side, yep. but there's nowhere to go. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So ultimately, as you know, I'll echo what Michael said, is that we're trying to get everything, all of our equipment, all of our facilities up to par, up safe, well-maintained facilities, 
echoing our mission statement. And then when we dive into that, I hope to see in the next couple of years that we're talking about future design and that we have big community discussions about that based upon our master plan and we start looking at 10 years down the road and you know budgeting a certain amount of money each year to get to the to that outcome if that makes sense yeah great so. man steve oh i got santa that's all i got awesome well thank you for the opportunity sure, yeah, if you yeah, have yeah, any yeah. questions i had a quick question yeah i walked away so i don't know where you guys had touched base on this thing so uh, yeah. the 80 grand for lake park is that something you're looking into if we continue to move on Lake Park soon, or is this something that if we don't know where we're at, it's pushed off till next year? Because that plus that 30 grand, that's a piece that ultimately could save you somewhere else. And if we're not gonna do Lake Park till later, then. Keep, keep in mind what we're doing with this particular budget is this budget starts July 1 and goes through June 30th of the following year. So, if we get back so what we're saying is within that calendar, or that fiscal year, we would be using that $80,000 for Lake Park in some form or fashion. Um, like uh, Eric said, he came up with some ideas on his own about how to go and improve that playground. Well, that may not be the way that the community wants to go. It may be 75000 it may be 20000 it may be $150,000, we don't know. Um, but Putting that out there is our best guess on what we would utilize to improve that park for uh, kids' playground equipment and so forth at Lake Park. Um, if we get to a point where we don't use that money, that money, there's two things that happen with that typically in all of our budgets. If we budget for something during the year and we don't use the funds, that money goes into fund balance. Okay. It goes directly into our savings account for the general fund. The second thing that, that is possible is at the end of the year, the department head will say, hey, I got this project. We're three quarters of the way through and getting it prepared, but I'll never be able to spend those, those dollars on implementation before the end of the fiscal year. Well, I can carry those monies over into the next fiscal year. So for instance, if we budgeted $50,000 to do X project this year, and they've done all the planning and they're just about ready, but they can't go and put the PO in to do the work in this fiscal year, I can carry that $50,000 over into next year. And then the project continues on. Um, right. So there's a couple of things that we do with money that is um, not used. Primarily, I'd say 90% of the money that is not used during a fiscal year is rolled into fund balance. So how much wasn't used last year? I don't have that number right in front of me. I'm sorry. That'd be interesting for us to know how much was not used it from each department. The total budget. Yeah. For total last both. year's budget. It was I would like say a both. Fifty two thousand dollar rollover number for carry forward. Are, are you asking right for now. all of the budgets or just for parts Each department. and rec? Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean so I, I can definitely get that to you and, and send that out to so you. So that's part of their um budget and during the year if they come to you for something, you use that 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 rollover or not? You don't it, know the rollover until the, the end of the fiscal the year. The only thing that we'll we'll do for the rollovers if, is if at the end of the year they have a project that they were planning on doing and they haven't been able to implement, I'll roll over those funds so they can continue to implement it the next year. Other than that, all the money that isn't spent falls into fund balance and goes back into our savings account. So I would so think what then I can, I can give you is I can give you an idea of how much and what kinds of projects rolled over from one year to the next, from last year to this current year, and how much went into fund balance. So they have to use their budget for the item that they discussed it was it was going towards. And then yeah. if not, it rolls over to you. So why wouldn't that number roll back o over into their next year's budget and be su line. subtracted? Tip Typically, we do zero-based budgeting, which is we start from a maintenance aspect every year of zero, and we build the budget clean for that year. So uh, I would ask each year what the rollover was from last year that each department didn't use for what they gave us the budget last year back. and see that number. Because you're telling me that goes back to the general fund. Yes, anything that is a general fund department goes back to the general fund for budgets. 
that's one thing to keep in mind is that each one of these departments, none of the departments have a revenue line item. Eric's revenue that he pulls in does not go into his budget to offset it. It goes into the general fund so Michael, to offset the general fund budget. Since we have um, two new council members, can you refresh my memory? I'm going to use them as an excuse, but refresh my memory. For example, on the um, capital improvements that Eric, if we came back and said, okay, we approve the parks and recs portion of your budget, except we want you to spend no more than X on a tractor and no more than X on a vehicle or no more than X on, you know, we're going to have to make you uh, rebid your maintenance storage. We're okay with Lake Park, it, you know, but don't spend more than 10 on functional training. Can, can we do that? Or what's, what's your preference for us to address these individual department budgets? For the most part, it is easier on staff if council says, for capital items, we agree with this capital item, move forward. If you don't use all the money, then we return that back to fund balance. Um, because okay, they've so done let, let, let's some just, general let's work. Stop, stop, to, stop right there. Just so, Joe Dan, you had asked me after our last council meeting to kind of walk you through some of these. So yeah. what's going to happen in this budget process is Michael's going to tell us he's projected X in revenue and Y in expenses. And we never have enough revenue to cover the expenses, and he takes the difference out of fund balance. Yep. Every year it appears that we don't always need the gap amount that he budgets. He'll budget $2 million in the gap coming out of fund balance, and we only spend a million. Yep. And the difference is we end up with more revenue, and some of these numbers come down. Okay. So he comes back and says, well, at the end of the year, I didn't really spend the entire budget that I thought I would, and we ended up with more revenue, so I only need to take a million instead of $2 million out of fund balance. So what we have been working with Michael over the last couple of years is get a little tighter on your projections. Don't come to us with a $2 million gap, and at the end of the year, not only do we not need the $2 million, we actually throw 500 into the fund balance. So you were two and a half instead of two. He's been tightening those up. What Leanne and I are asking here is, on this capital improvement, do we pin them down and say, you can't have more than 20 grand on the storage building, and you can't spend more than 15 on a tractor? We don't care. If you can't get one for 15, don't buy one. Michael's saying, no, don't do that. Just tell me you can approve the capital improvement. What that's going to lead to is that large gap at the end of the day. He's going to come back and say, you approved all this. I need, I need X out of fund balance. And then, and this is what Debbie provides us every month. Is she said, you spent this out of fund balance. These are unbudgeted. So that's the fudging that we've, we've talked about, where Michael budgets correctly conservative revenues and high on expenses and so that's the dance that we have to do and my concern is off of what Steve just said if we continue to increase each, increase each department let's say by 175,000 or I don't even know what you guys are going to say then at some point we've either got to raise taxes or find another way to pay for these increases in department budgets if you want the services yes ma'am right that's what I'm saying so I'm trying to figure out how do we not like when you say twenty twenty thousand dollars for the you know, functional training room at the rec center. I, I don't know what you're asking for. Or do you really need it? I mean, I, I, I don't. I don't know. Does that That's get it. rolled back? And I would tell you, I, I've been in that room. Me too. It needs something. Yeah. I can't tell you if 20 gets the job done or eight or 25. Know. And what Michael's saying is, trust me to go out and do that. And if I don't spend the 20, it's going to go back into your fund balance. And that's part of why you have staff is to go and research those things. Uh, Eric wouldn't. Eric's not taking a dart and throwing it at the board and saying, okay, today it's going to hit 40000 I need that. He's actually going out and researching different types of products and saying, I think this would work, I think this wouldn't work, and making a plan and saying, this is how we'd approach it. And now, so that's the policy of governance issue, which is, as a council, my education has been, we're supposed to give that overarching policy. Michael, you say you need, Eric, you say you need these things, go do it. Michael, it's up to you to pick whether it's a... A, a Makita or a John Deere, and if it's a small one or a medium one, we're telling you go fill that job. Right. Um, I just care about low maintenance. Yeah. And so do and we, that, and that's why we've been that maintaining We need to make things. sure Michael understands. We, we would prefer longevity, low maintenance. Right. Um, and hopefully we've got a manager I, that understands we want the best bang for the buck. Yeah. If I could add something, too, when, when I go over these capital items um, with Michael, there's priorities on them as well. So each of them has like a priority versus, you know, high priority, low priority, right? So like the functional training room obviously is one thing that's probably in the lower priority. 
Um, and then when I look at like the John Deere tractor or the truck, the concern is is when you're putting together these departmental budgets, is I don't know whether this tractor is going to make it through that fiscal year. So we plug it in, but if it makes it through, that's great. But if it doesn't, I don't have it budgeted, then it's coming back to council and asking for But that the money. money still stays in your pot, is what I'm saying, which increased by 100. And you just happen to be the yeah. first one so presenting, Eric, it's so it's there, not I'm you. Gonna, <laughs> I'm going to get the new tractor, if that makes sense. That's where it's. Well, you can look at what his actuals were last year. He budgeted, um, he, he did in 16, 17, he budgeted 697. He spent 637, so there were 60. This year, he's saying he budgeted 776, and miraculously, he year to date is going to spend it all to the penny um well and and keep in mind the the number yeah, that I, we I the, the number that we project no, for what right. we expect to spend changes on a monthly basis so so when we get down to it we'll end up going and drilling into each particular line item to figure out exactly so how michael much again spend. for for the mayor and and for councilman um garzo what we've done in the past number of years at the end of, we go through all these department presentations and we come back and you make a presentation to us that said guys I'm going to have X in revenue and Y in expenses and the gap is this you have three ways to close the gap cut my budget raise your taxes or pay it out of See. reserves okay and the or argument increase my budget well, either just approve my approved budget yep and you can cover that gap with uh, the, the general fund or raising property taxes or um, cut. So we have come back in the past and said to Michael, Michael, your gap is two million, you get it down to a million and a half. I don't care where you cut it. You can go back to Eric and tell him, Eric, you can't have a tractor, you can't have a truck. I don't, it's, I'm not going to nitpick with him. I'm, for me, I'm going to say, Michael, close the gap. Be, be, you can't have two out of general fund. So you don't want us to nitpick all the way down just at the, at the end? I don't. I mean, I certainly think Eric and, and staff has been competent enough to say I've prioritized my capital improvement needs. I need all these things. If, I, if, if there's one I have to give up, I know which one that is. And that's basically right. how we would prefer to have it. I mean, I, I don't mind if it is on the departmental level or if it's on the general budget level. But, for instance, um, as Eric said, things like the vehicle, is going to be a low priority. Uh, the weight room is going to be a low priority. There's other things that if you came back and said, I tell you what, cut 10% out of your capital improvement and we'll call it good, I'd figure out which things were low and those things would come off the top. And that's what I'd come back to you at the end and say, okay, Eric says you told us to cut 10% of the capital, so our number is X, and this is what we're not going to be getting this year. And those are the big chunks that we've looked at in the past, guys, has been um, changes in their capital improvement plan requests, doing a hiring freeze, or um, the COLA and the, and the other staff um, uh, pay scale issues, um, or raising taxes. The, and, the, and those have been the areas that we focused on and generally have told Michael, you need to run the town, you need to have a copy machine, or you need to have a police department. How you get there is on you. And what he just said is my concern. When it gets to the point, we can sit here all day long, but when it gets to the point we don't have enough money, we're the ones who got to answer to the public for their taxes being increased. Yep. To pay for the budgets. Right. At which point we're either going to say we'll increase taxes or cut your budget. And that's up to you, Michael. Get your red pen out. That's right. That's why you pay me. Okay. The big bucks. My turn, um, and, and I'll be very quick. Fund balance is another way of saying savings account. Yes, sir. To which we strive to achieve 50%. That's yes. our goal that we discussed last time. Um, when I went over the numbers, I zeroed in on the budget anomalies from fiscal year to fiscal year. The way you presented it, Eric, great job. Well explained, articulated, and defensible. I think that's really another way of saying being good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. Yep is we can defend what's being presented as good for the community. I see that here. Um, one question and then a closing comment before we move on. Uh, do you foresee, or at what point in time do you foresee a need for a seventh full-time employee? I, you don't have it, obviously, in the budget here, but... Um, I, I don't. And it's I, a demand signal, really. That yeah, it, it is. You know, we take on a lot more uh, programs uh, through you know, uh, the f family and I, the Christmas spicy, 
a lot of that stuff we're we're well we're doing really well with volunteers really well our parks and recreation advisory committee does an awesome job coming out and helping us with some of these events we also really utilize our our part-time staff i i don't i mean i don't i don't see that happening um it, you, you know right now i feel i feel like we are lean and we are good to go great one of the things that you'll also notice is that um parks and rec tends to be heavy on part-time uh, employees and each year I ask Eric the same question of okay can you put two part-timers together and make them a full-timer and get better bang for your buck out of it and most of the time because of the operational components that they have to run and how they have to staff things it's easier to go and staff things as a part-time person where I only need to fill a 20 percent or 20 hour gap a week and use a part-timer than to hire a full-timer so we do that on an annual basis in all the departments on where we can go with our personnel and do we need this or can we change something and i guess on, on this, and i know i'm probably over my allotted time here but just really quickly uh, when we're looking at employees the one thing that we were you know potentially throwing around in the parks and advisory committee is that we have an independent contract instructor program all of our instructors are hired uh i mean are through contract instructors and we did look at ways of generating additional revenue by bringing somebody potentially in-house down the road um, and bringing that all in and then monitoring the classes is more like a business um, and making sure they break even and all that stuff so that that's one thing that we've thrown around um, it's kind of in our master plan but we're trying to, again trying to get our facilities where we want them to be before we start diving and looking into that any further so your option one on Ryder Lewis Park could be achieved if we strip one of those vehicles out, throw that back into the eighty-three thousand. Correct. Yeah. As as an option, if that yes. is the priority. Yeah, I mean, if the priority is Ryder Lewis and finishing it, we'll make it. Okay. We, we, I'll and, be honest with you. Th that's the kind of comments that that are extremely helpful to us. If if you I look just did at a quick this, crunch, it's one hundred nine. Yeah. Or you could reduce the it, budget so. by one hundred nine and do fundraiser for the difference. I know you can raise twenty thousand dollars for Ryder Lewis. And who's going to manage that fund Absolutely. fundraising? Yeah. Or more. The, the, the Ryder Lewis, I mean, we've been working on it. We, we, we met with Ryder Lewis. They're going to be doing some fundraising. They need to get to a certain stage before they have something that can actually cut the ribbon and do an effective fundraising. Mm -hmm. So the 80 or the 100 that they're asking for in, in option one or option two is only a fraction of what's going to be needed to finish the park to phase two, three, one, two, and three. And the long-term fundraising, they're talking about working with Fort Fisher, Susie, yeah. Um, part of there, there's some strategy out there but what Ryder Lewis Jerry and Eric determined was to be able to effectively raise money they'd like to show some work in progress so he's saying either give them the 80 or the 100 um, and, and, and I'm okay with that I'd um, like to see phase one completed by your ribbon cutting to well, be honest kind of, with you even that, if that, that cost was, twenty more thousand dollars that was the request right that was the idea. I it was just a line item swap. And I think those numbers went up because yeah, they, when they fine-tuned it, they had to do an ADA ramp, um, which extended right, yeah, out the boardwalk right. from their first call. All of a sudden, they're looking at a few yeah. additional things. And I mean, I'd rather see that. I mean, the twenty grand go to Ryder Lewis than but the, the, the way and, there, and there was some I thought see. that those are outside numbers at 106 or whatever, that there's some local contractors that may be willing to do some of that stuff. At a reduced price. So yeah, absolutely. One, yep. one thing that uh, could be very helpful is as we're going through this, you'll find in your budget book that we printed out for you, um, in one of the sections, it is a capital list. And you'll see everything listed out there in the capital items. Um, what would be very helpful is you giving us priorities. Uh, that's a way that I can use your comments on priorities to go and reduce a budget or change what we're funding and how. So for instance, with Eric's, he's got uh, six items listed out there. Go one through six and send me an email and say, here's my ranking for this. Where and that, that way that way, I could go and take that information and say, OK, these are the things that we're going to go yeah, we and We may cut. have stumbled across that just now. I had one last question. Uh, with the Lake Park. Is it possible to tie that 80 grand into the budget for the lake? If that's something we don't move forward on? Are we allowed to dip into that in regards to resurfacing, refacing, and revamping? Not necessarily, because the removal of the equipment for the, for the park mm -hmm. 
was not because of the dredging. It's not something that we borrowed money for. Okay. Um, if that was the case, yes, you could have. It, basically, the things that we borrowed money for were water, sewer, and stormwater improvements okay. overall for the town and these projects. We can move the projects here and there, but within those constraints. So because it's not a parks and rec item in there, uh, that we looked at it, we can't. All right. That's understandable. Eric, awesome job, man. Thank you very much. Eric, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. If you all have any questions, just call, email. Or face to face. Face to face. Stop in. Yeah. All right. Um, the next one that we're going to do is the fire department. And once again, I've, I've moved my, my budget to the fire department budget. I'm going to minimize this uh, and pull up the fire budget information. You should have made him go first. He can have whatever he wants. <laughs> You're done. Let's just get cool to place. You're good. All yours, Chief. Yeah. Mayor, Council, thanks a lot, and I will make this as painless as possible for you guys. You say as painful as possible? Pa painless. I heard a less. <laughs> I don't know your pain threshold, so it's kind of hard for me to determine that right now. I know Joe Dan's. Depends on the day. <laughs> um, we shared a bunk bed. DC. Basically, what I want to do is start off with um, with uh, talking about the strategies that um, are what I looked at from a strategic standpoint for what we're trying to achieve with our budget. Um, under personnel and benefit, um, basically maintaining what we have currently, but I'm also um, under our M&O budget, I'll discuss it just a little bit about applying for the federal uh, sister firefighter grant. Um, and actually in the but, uh, workshop coming up next week, um, I'll be presenting to you guys that exact plan so that we can look at moving forward with applying for that grant. Um, under M&O, basically um, most of our changes to our budget was to improve and increase our um, professional staff development for our members, uh, continue to work towards rotating out, turn out gear, equipment, stuff like that. Um, that allows us to maintain and properly have our equipment that um, our firefighters have the best equipment they can have to do the job that they need to do. And then maintain uh, our current equipment that we have and keep it in a response ready state. Under capital, um, I'll make that easy. I'm not requesting anything under capital, but I will discuss something at the end that I want to put on your radar for the future. Um, under our um, payroll and benefits, basically there was a $48,000 increase. A lot of that increase comes specifically from um, us looking at um, increased insurance costs, retirement, um, things like that. So those are, like Mike said earlier, that I don't have control over. It's what HR looks, projects, and what Mike has put in for um, our COLAs and merits. But to start at the top, the increases that I did ask for um, I'm looking at increasing our summer staff levels on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday um, to add one additional um, person to that to the staffing, and we're going to do that through our volunteer staff. We have a they get paid per call, so what we do is we can bring them in, um, have them help staff during the day um, for the increased call volume, and we can uh, pay compensate them through their pay per call status, and that increase is just us adding those through the through the summer months when we see our call volume really skyrocket um, and it, at times multiple calls going on stretched out between the north end and and all, all over the islands so um, the second part was to increase our overtime pay um, just a little bit in order to we do what's called a kelly day uh, may get a little bit in depth and i can explain it one-on-one -on -one if you guys need me to later but the short of it is the firefighters that work 24-hour shifts are scheduled to work nine days a month. Every month, one of those shifts by default falls into a 10th day. So to prevent from play, paying overtime, currently we make them take the shift that's on duty for that uh, 10th day. We, we require them to take that day off, and then we backfill it with paper call, admin staff, whatever we can do to eliminate that. And what we've saw over the last year is that gets very challenging that every month three people are already taking one day off 
to fill that on top of vacation, sick, and, and comp leave that, that has to come out. So what we're looking at doing instead of us requiring these guys to take off and then us scrambling to fill to keep a minimum staffing of three on an engine, we're just going to eliminate that, that requirement that we have them take that day off throughout the year. Um, the reclassification of staff, um, this past year my deputy chief was had a volunteer deputy chief that retired um, and, he, and he did fill a big role for us but currently um, when you look at our department from a administrative level um, you have a chief and you really have no assistant or deputy so pretty much it puts all the burden on me to run everything operationally come over and deal with staff meetings try to answer most of the calls um, and it, it does put a little bit of burden on me so what we what we're looking at doing is currently I've took and, and dumped a lot of my load onto a current staff member and said you know I need you to do this project, this project, oversee this, oversee that. It's not in their job description or their job title. So working with Mike, we're, we're going to reclassify that position um, into a deputy role, and that way when we rewrite the job description, it will, it will entitle that this is what they're operationally responsible for. Um, so basically just realign that position. So instead of me coming to you guys and saying I need $70,000 to add a whole brand new position, so that I can have an assistant. I just want to uh, reward a current staff member who's already doing a lot of those tasks, reclassify them, and also give them that, um, basically in our world, the authority to be in that, uh, over that operational part of the, of the staff. Um, the Merit and Cola, like I said, comes from Mike, the insurance retirement. Longevity was added to uh, my budget this year. Um, that currently was in HR's budget and I think all departments saw that move over. So that increase was just really not an increase. It's a transfer from HR's budget to mine in the, in the next budget year. And then of course, FICA is an increase. So um, basically my increases were just to help us better function during the summer and then organizationally have a little bit more of a tiered organization instead of one member up top and then a whole list below us to kind of help when I'm out of town or um, 24 hours a day, I don't have to be the guy they call because the, the truck's got a check engine light on kind of thing. So um, help me operationally. Under my M&O, my uh, maintenance and operation part, um, some of the major increases, and I just put major because some of them may have went up a little bit and other line items went down a little bit, but I captured my bigger ones. Um, the first one, the, the Motorola lease and portable agreement, um, there was a little bit of um, the way the budget shows when you look at from last year to this year, that 19.6 was in my budget last year. We immediately moved it over into the PD, so when you look at your current comparison, that's not showing up in mine, so it looks like an increase, but it, last year that was in there, and this is a lease we did. Um, the PD pays their part, I pay my part. So that it's technically not an increase, but it does show it. So I didn't want to confuse you guys by not. Is that a yearly fee? It's for three years, Chief. Okay. So, so it's like a you have yes. to pay it. This is our yeah. second year of the lease, and we got well, it's a lease to purchase. Basically. Several years ago in the budget, we talked about the need that Motorola about every five years redoes their system and makes it so you have to buy new equipment. Um, and that's what this was, is the upgrade so that we would have the the best equipment for communications. Um, and it was a three-year lease on the program. This is the last year for the lease. Okay. Um, basically, my maintenance and repair of vehicles, we increased that line item just a little bit. And some of that is we have basically set up with um, our vendors that come in and they do all of our maintenance and stuff on our apparatus. Um, our equipment has set maintenance, and as equipment gets older, that goes up every year. Obviously, when you have a vendor that comes in and they charge you $500 per vehicle last year, it's probably going to be 550 this year. So we reached out, tried to get a good grip on what was increasing, and then of course the struggles that we you, that you have that you can't predict is what equipment gets damaged. So this this covers damaged equipment at fires, uh, equipment that's aging that we constant that we're having to repair. So an increase there. Um, the reason that the safer grant 
uh, it's a staffing grant, but we already had a line item established because we've applied for this grant in the past and received it. The grant does a lot of different things. Staffing's one of them. Um, we, we received it one time for recruitment and retention, which allowed us to beef up some of our house program. So this line item was already established, so we left it there at M&O. Um, but when I present to you guys next week, we're going to discuss that the grants out there that's um, available to us, and we're going to present that, what it means to you guys, what the match is, and then work forward from there. Do you have the information that you could do it now if they were interested? Uh, not fully. Okay. I got a whole separate PowerPoint that All right. I was doing for that. Okay. Um, Just to check. If you guys have questions, I can go over it, but basically Tuesday we were planning on taking and just focusing on that so you can see the moving parts of that grant because there is some preliminary um, investment that the federal government does and it tears down over three years and at the end of three years we take over the full uh, salary of those employees so um, and part of that is me talking about the need and and we're, what we're seeing going on on our side from response and then we have a rental property that was increase this year um, at the state park where we, we housing the boat slip there when we first bought the boat we looked at multiple options of where to house it one was a state park one was us taking current um, street ends and maybe building our own dock and, and we might look at that in the future but right now the state park um, just seems to be working very well for us it cost us $2,500 a year we're in a nice slip power water it's easy for us to come out of the fire station, pull right into the state park. There's plenty of parking. They have a fire lane right from the building that the engine fits perfect in, um, like it was built for a fire engine. And um, the street ends would give us so much challenge in the summer trying to work down canal, get a big fire truck down there, park it. Then it's at the state park, there's always a ranger around if somebody's messing with the truck while their guys are out on a call. We just feel like right now we want to stick with that property. And in the future, if we see something, um, we've talked about the marina, but that's a no-wake zone all the way up the marina. It's a bad, a bad situation for us to try to come out of there and, and potentially damage or hurt um, something. So I don't think you can get a better situation than the state park. Did, yeah. you, so you're saying you have a good relationship? Yes. And what do you do when the gate's locked? Do they have a, you give you a key? Or? Yes. Okay. And we have a key to everything in town, every gate. It's a bolt cut. No, I'm just kidding. Nah. But, um, <laughs> That's what I was thinking when you said that. No, but we do have all the codes for the state park, and they they work well with us because we have to get in there after hours anyways for the campgrounds, uh, medical calls, you know, camping fires, things like that. So we, we're out there. The guys are pretty familiar with getting in and out of the state park. So overall, my increase was 84.8 on that. But to kind of clarify that, I'm only asking for 12000 and 400 at the end of the day increase if you took out the safer grant and you took out the 196 that the lease that was already really established so for me my increase was currently only 124 not to confuse you once we talk about the safer grant that that'll be something we talk about uh next week and that will or won't happen next year in the budget hey chief is that another way of saying you're I say mission critical and then nice to have that's your prioritized list um or not no or sir. if you were to have a if you were to prioritize what you're presenting what would it right look like so what we shows? looked at was increasing staffing and what we looked at me and mike talked about was we owe it to you guys that there's grants out there okay. so instead of me just coming and saying give me three personnel please um we thought let's go after a grant and see if we can get it because the, the initial match of that is 65 35. Federal pays 65, we pay 35 for two years. And then the last year, you flip that, we pay 65 35. So it allows us, as we see the growth, the call volume increase. So you look and say, where, where's the fire department going to be in three to five years? In three to five years, we're going to have to have those personnel. So if I can land you guys a grant to help build us to that point, it, it, it's a win-win for us, and that's why Mike wanted me to break that out and, and specifically talk about it and kind of get a head nod and say do or don't go after this grant. And if you say, you know, table it, we'll talk about that too. Yep. So, Based on what you presented at the uh, awards banquet in terms of the volume of calls and the trajectory, 
it's it, it, it's defensible. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll and choose you. I'm gonna lay that out a little bit better. I'll show you guys, you know, a, a ten year run of what we saw in call volumes, how we're increasing, and just the increase in service, and, and it goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, as you see, our our shoulder se seasons extend, and you see the the. What, what are we doing Tuesday, Chief? I'll check on my workshop. Workshop. Oh, this next Tuesday. Tuesday? Woo, shuttles. You and I are gonna be out of town, bud. We get back Tuesday afternoon. It's a night workshop. Come on, you don't mean All right, I'll leave. <laughs> Bring dinner. I did not mean to be the bearer of that bad news, sir. Yeah, I forgot about I'm that. I'm happy to do <laughs> um, Alan, are you saying that you feel pretty confident in this $52,000 uh, grant? The grant. Do I feel confident? I think so. Have um, you been getting it? I've never received the staff. Gotcha. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. We won the staffing grant six or eight years ago before I was here, when Chief Roy was here. And and at the time that they choose, the town chose to back down and not go with the grant. Um, I say we were awarded it. We, we basically was. Um, talking with um, the grant person at the federal level, uh, a good friend of mine just won this grant last year and got eight employees. He gave me his grant to copy and the verbiage and stuff. So I feel confident we got a good run with that. We, we, we actually have two critical infrastructures that affect our island, which is a nuclear plant in Sunny Point. And then you put the influx of visitors that we see in the summer versus the winter i think it's a very winnable situation in the grant world so that brings your total increase down to like yeah. sixty thousand. that's what right. you said if, if you guys go after that yes so um and that's why i didn't really put that number hard in there i just wanted you guys to know when you look at it from a basic m o standpoint if you took out the grant we're pursuing and the lease that was already established I, i'm only going up twelve thousand on my day-to-day -day operational stuff that was kind of my key point, that I tried to trim that fat as much as I could um, and, and stay low. Like I said, no capital, but what I do want to discuss here for just a brief second is that this is the last year that we have a debt service on our ladder truck. Um, not that we run right back out and purchase another truck, but um, we have two pieces of fire uh, equipment that um, were purchased back to back um, over um, both of them are pushing about 18 years old one's 18 one's like 16 um, so what we're looking at when we go to look at purchasing new equipment like that for us it's about an 18 to 24 month process you spend about six to eight months doing research and development of the new piece of equipment and then you go to bid and it's about a somewhere between a 10 and 12 month build time so what we're looking at was not pursue money this budget year because we still have a, a debt service of 77 out there for the latter. But after this budget year, it ends. And it's a good time for us to look at replacing one of the other piece of equipment that's getting close to 20 years old. So I just wanted to put that out there that we're not asking for capital, but I will be going and starting that process for next year. of evaluating what engine we need and the potential cost and we'll be bringing that back probably next budget year to ask for could we go to bid on that so um, that's something that you'll see in the future and just to kind of recap um, there's our final numbers um, and the highlights that I wanted to point out was that we want to increase that summer staffing by one person from Memorial Day to Labor Day um, we're going to look at the AFG grant with you guys. Um, and in our training budget, we increased it a little bit just to keep improving our staff development, our senior staff, getting them in more advanced classes. Um, our building maintenance increased just a little bit, but our building got remodeled. But every two or three years, if you don't stay on repainting and carpet and things like that, it's just stuff that happens with a building our size. And then, um, our, our uniform budget increased just a little bit, but that was what we talked about, keeping our gear upgraded, um, meeting the national standard of not having any structural turnout gear older than 10 years old in service and on members' back. So um, pretty much it was a pretty pretty clean, clean uh, budget for us this year. We tried to keep everything minimal on the increases. Any questions on the fire department side? Okay. Moving to Ocean Rescue, um, <clears throat> basically the big change this year when we looked at what strategic budget goals I wanted to meet, um, one of our challenges that we've seen is, is not only getting 
the quantity of guards we need, which is the 40 to work the beach for the summer, is also getting quality. So when you compete with uh, multiple beaches down in a very short dry period, and now when you see Sunset Beach and other beaches are adding guards too, all that pool becomes competitive. So we wanted to continue to increase our lifeguard pay to get them up to just what, when we see some of our returning guards leave us to go work in the restaurant or, or um, the service industry because they can make more money in one evening than they could make a week for us. We have to, we can't comp compensate that, but we, we were paying $10 an hour a couple of years ago and we, uh, no, no um, disrespect to parts or to uh, operations, but we were paying the guy on the beach picking up trash a lot more money than we was the lifeguard sitting in the stand. So for, what are you paying them now? Um, this year it'll it's moving it'll be twelve fifty is what we advertise. And do they how many hours a week do they typically get? Um, it depends on the guard. Some can work part time. Some, the ones that work full time, full -time? is forty, okay. um, or what we call seasonal. And are these college kids that come? Predominantly, yes. Okay. Um, I just kind of when you said that about the service industry, good luck because we can't get them either. They're not going to the restaurants. <laughs> yeah. Um, some of the things. I don't know where they are, but some of that some of that increase wasn't just uh, salary. Um, it was also extending the season past Labor Day. Um, historically, we end Labor Day, we go home, clean up equipment, and the fire department takes over that full responsibility. But we're, we're, we've seen in the last couple of years that there's three or four weeks following Labor Day, the weekends, that, that taxes the fire department and pulls us away from that fire suppression role because we're spending a lot of time on the beach. Um, we also heard very clearly from some of the council members that they would like to see that season extended. So w currently we budgeted to keep on a small group of guards for through the weekend all the way up to October 1st this year. So we're going to extend it to October 1st, see how that works. Um, I will say our challenge is that when these college kids go back to school in August, we lose probably 50 to 60 percent of our guards. Uh, maybe even higher than that. The other percentage that we lose comes from, okay, I know I'm, I don't have a job in three weeks, so I start applying. And then, when, and then when a company hires them and says, I'm hiring you start next week, they're not going to be loyal to us because they've got to go work for the winter. So it's a challenge, and we're, we're working on ways to overcome that by up front this year during the, the hiring process, we're, we're asking for commitment, for lack of better terms, all the way up to October 1st from a handful of guards. And that's to man every other station or just to kind of keep as many on the Percentage. beach as possible? Honestly, it, it may be, depending on staff, and we, it may just be vehicles on the beach, four-wheelers on the beach. It may not be stands. Um, we, we're confident we probably won't be able to keep more than five or ten on past Labor Day. Not that we wouldn't want to. It's that we, I don't think we're going to have too. that many to stay. But if I can have three to five on, we can put a couple in a pickup and a couple in four-wheelers. And we're still in a kind of a reactive mode, but yet we're on the beach and we can get there a lot quicker than coming from Dow Road, you know, in a, in a fire engine. So, Are you saying you need the additional four-wheelers for the extended time? Uh, no, ma'am. On the four-wheelers, we replace two four-wheelers every year. Um, that's pretty much been our standard since I took the program over. And what do you do with the old ones? We sell them, and uh, it goes back in general fund. Okay. And we've got pretty good revenue out of those for, for what you would think they're worth. But a four-wheeler is good for about three years on the beach. Um, we, we run six four-wheelers, so we buy two a year, and basically it's just a rotation. We don't have any. Do we have any lifeguards on Freeman Park? Uh, yes, there's two four-wheelers that patrol. They're, okay, they, and, they're just on patrol, not in the... Park. That's correct. And on a busy weekend, it's two four-wheelers and a pickup. So there's three, at least three guards on Freeman Park patrolling. Okay. Now that, in the week, during the week, it's scaled way down Friday, Saturday, Sunday, especially holiday weekends. We even might even add a um, fourth or fifth. So the total park. budget includes all the Freeman Park coverage as well at the $508,000? That's correct. Right. Um, so under M&O, pretty much the only thing we've done was um, our building rental increased. We have no control over that. Um, we actually rent that building on the boardwalk. Um, one of the things that I'm going to mention here, just to kind of me and Mike discuss putting it out there a little bit, is we are looking. Um, we, heard, we heard you guys discussing 
maybe remodeling some bathrooms, making things better. We, we eyeball in uh, Hamlet Avenue a little bit. That's a very good spot for us to potentially put a, no, a new substation for the guards and get off of the boardwalk. Now that we've closed the boardwalk in, we used to could pull our pickups up, load ice, water, move equipment. Now it's almost Chief, impossible. Chief, what's your total rent then down at the boardwalk? Ballpark. It's, it's okay, 13 yeah. a year. 13 a year right now. That um, and that's increase? a rent, right? And that, that's a rental. And currently the discussions with the property owner is their goal is to go up to 24. So, uh, so about how big a, is that the corner spot? What is that, a 20 by 40 building, 20 by 20? The They're about 40, feet. I believe, is what it is, 20 by 40. So 800 square feet? Yeah, something like that. So we, we could even, theoretically redo yes. the bathroom at Hamlet and put a building down there? What our what our thought was is that you could redo the bathroom at Hamlet, maybe even expand it, right. put a substation there where you could park the vehicles underneath, uh, you know, the four-wheelers and so right. forth. They have easy access to the beach that way and put a... Um, meeting type room for the guards and changing and stuff and like that. And then what we used to have on canal, story. what are we using the canal building for that you guys used to house your ATVs and do meetings and stuff? Yeah, that used to be, well, we've always been either down at the the um, boardwalk or at one point we did have a trailer set up, but that room there was, the police had a substation there, we had a little room in there and it was just for them to come out. And what do are we doing course. with that building now? Not much. And the reason for that is because the um, the height of it isn't high enough for us to pull all of our vehicles and everything underground. And the upstairs, it's very small and confined. Uh, you couldn't get uh, two people in each one of the rooms, I don't believe. So we initially used it for um, the beach ranger and a place for the beach ranger to go. Um, but right now, there really isn't a usable operation down there. So, do I hear you saying that we're working ourselves out of lease in this building, or not? I mean, I would rather see. Let me just—you don't even have to answer that. I would rather see us buy a property or build a property that we have longevity in than continuing to lease something that we don't have any control of. And that's basically what we're looking at: is what is the future of that facility that we're using and what do we need down there to help the uh, operations for the lifeguards so along those yes. lines I'd like you to look at um, as we talked about needing desperately to remodel the Hamlet bathroom and showers just come up with a structure that incorporates what you need for the lifeguards and vehicle storage do it all in one, do it all in one and figure out what that is because at thirteen thousand dollars a year that's a hundred and that's a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage yep. mm -hmm. right? right so you build a lot of building for that Yes, and that was sort of my, my thought, is that we could use that same funds just to pay for something. operations. You know, it's just like what we did with our operations department. I mean, we have to house our people in our property. Yes. We can't depend on leased property. That's correct. So you'll put that on the on the to-do list? Uh, yes, uh, I'll give one. you a little bit more information on that as we go through the process. And did I hear you say that it's looking to go to 24 uh 24,000 that's doubling that's, that's the goal of the property owner yes in next next year or? Uh, they wanted to do it this year but I okay so you got a, you got a year yes and um, basically increase our uniform budget was the only other M O that we really saw and that's just cause we buy um, board shorts basically from CB surf shop and every year everything creeps up T-shirts, things like that. Everything increases a little bit. When you're buying 40 sets of everything, uh, it don't take much to go up $1,000 on your whole uniform. And this year we're actually uh, having to transfer a little bit of money over in the uniforms to finish out our uniform purchase this year. So what we saw was we go to buy something and then they go, oh, there's a $5 increase in bathing suits and you're buying 50. We give everybody two board shorts, so there's 80 board shorts. It don't take long for that to go our budget to go up so um, capital projects like we said two four wheelers that we replace every year that's that's a reoccurring cost and the last thing was um, a replacement vehicle on the lifeguard side and and what we saw here is this actually started with a conversation that we're we're actually replacing two vehicles on the fire side we're, we're eliminating those and adding one um, and the reason this is in the lifeguard budget is that the two vehicles I'm placing, um, 
both of them are one's a 99 and one's a 2006. They both have well over 100,000 miles. We saw a need to consolidate those two vehicles into one. And part of my increased staffing this summer is to quit running a half million dollar engine on Saturday all over the island for medical calls. We were going to take this vehicle and it's going to be a medical response vehicle. Now, the reason it's in the ocean rescue budget is because we bought, um, we currently have full size vehicles on the beach. And that's what we've had for years. The beach is getting skinnier and skinnier and the crowds are getting bigger and bigger. And for us to maneuver out there with a full size pickup is really getting difficult. So a couple of years back, we had bought the Ocean Rescue Director a new full-size pickup with a bed cover, which is really what I needed over in the fire side now. So we're going to get rid of two fire vehicles. We're going to shift his over into that role, and we're going to replace this vehicle with a small, like a Tacoma, something along those lines. It's more easy to maneuver through the, the crowds and stuff on the beach um, um, for them. And that's where – and the, the vehicle's not 40 – that is the vehicle plus red light striping, um, bed cover, all the things so how we much need is to just outfit. A vehicle? Thirty, okay. and that's a that's a crew cab four wheel drive Tacoma on state contract. Okay. And pretty much what we saw from our winter meeting um, with with all the lifeguard beaches up and down the coast, almost every beach is moving to either Tacoma or uh, Frontier, something smaller. Um, because everybody's having the same problems that um, over the last five years we've just seen the beach population grow and with us around the boardwalk area now um, is is really getting tough for us to move around on a weekend so there's been there's been days that that chad hasn't been able to go past the tiki bar or barely get to the boardwalk with a full-size pickup and it, it's bad when your supervisor can't ride the beach to check on guards. Well, there's so. less impact on the beach if it's a smaller vehicle. Yes, yes. And um, just basically recapping that, um, very little changes to um, what we saw in the budget um, from last year. We're, we're adding a, the vehicles, the big thing, and then a little bit of increase in pay. Just a few things I wanted to put out there that you guys will see for changes this year. Um, we are looking at, we have stands, originally we put stands at almost every crossover. Um, uh, not every, but just about every. Well, one of the biggest complaints we get is, why is this stand not set? You're never setting this stand. You, you got all these stands. We just don't have the guards to do it, but we needed some flexibility when we done them. Um, we're wanting to relocate some stands. We're going to beef up our coverage around the hamlet to Harper area, um, add stands in there. So instead of going and asking for money to add stands, we went back and looked statistically at where we have rescues at. And we saw stands that we didn't even sit once last year, maybe twice, just sitting there. There's never a guard in it, and there was not even a rescue recorded in front of it. Um, so we're going to relocate those stands to areas we need them, pull them off the beach, the, one, the other ones, and use them for future stand issues when stands are in bad shape, we're, we're going to switch those out. And to do that, we're hoping we'll eliminate some of that feedback from the public that why is this stand never set and things like that. So just kind of wanted you guys to be aware we were going to do some shifting because you, you will get phone calls. We're going to get them. Um, so um, everybody wants to stand right in front of their house, and it, it just we, it's hard to do that. So um, we talked about extending the season this year um, with limited staff and past Labor Day. And then, again, I put that little blurb in there that we are researching to relocate our substation. You guys heard, I think we heard clear that you want us to explore that option. Yeah. So. Well, Chief, just a quick question about the uh, lifeguard locations. Do you have a list <coughs> of where lifeguards are actually stationed at? <coughs> I think for the public, for visitors particularly, I have had people ask me, can you tell me where the lifeguards are? I always say Hamlet, but that puts a ton of people on Hamlet. But well, if we... Yeah. And I do that, but if we knew the, the locations of different street ends that had um, – And, and that, that would help is so fluid throughout the industry. day. So we run guards in two shifts, mm -hmm. an early shift, and there's a later shift that comes in, and then the early shift goes home midday. So what you see is every other stand or even more sporadic is sit – or they're sitting around 10 that morning. By 1 o'clock, there's a lot of, of them filled in. 
and then by four or five they start it starts shrinking back down so for us to say today we're sitting this stand and we may not have a stand sit say at sandpiper but all of a sudden a rip's bad down there we'll move guards to where the problems are so I do what, get asked that question. They'll say, I want to take my kids where the lifeguards are. And I always say Hamlet because I, I know there's and always what, one there. What I tell people is look for the flags. If the flag's out, there's a guard in that stand. If we come off the stand, they blow the whistle, wave their off-duty flag, they come down, and there's no flags on that stand. So when you walk on the beach stand and you look down the beach, if you see a flag sticking out, which, whether it's green, yellow, or red, that's where the guard's sitting at that day. So, so always, we encourage people when they when they call us and say, hey, I'm renting a house on CBA North. Where do I go? I say, if you really, we encourage you to swim near a guard. Mm -hmm. So when you walk out on the beach, look for that flag. You might have to walk a block up, but it's for your safety to stay in that area. So okay. any other questions? Hey, real, just a closing comment. Uh, thanks, Alan. Nicely done. I like the dynamic nature of the stands. That makes sense because inevitably where they are and where they go are questions that are going to come back to council. So appreciate that. Um, the season expansion to 1 October, obviously yep. we got beachcombers long beyond that, but the challenge is something else that we have to uh, inevitably explain is the talent, where to find the talent and where to find the lifeguards after that. Uh, and then finally, just as uh, Councilman Shuttleworth pointed out, Michael, you and I had talked about it, uh, not a dual use, but really using that Hamlet bathroom, revamping that eventually with an ROT payback and <clears throat> moving the um, ocean rescue facility there. That's, to me, I, I, that's common sense. So thanks, Alan. That's all yes, sir. My questions aren't particularly to Alan, but to Michael. Um, Michael, in the budget for the lifeguards, is 100% of that budget requested from the TDA out of the RT funds or just the salaries or is it the equipment, everything? No, it's just the personnel and benefits section. That just is, that, is that all we're allowed to request? No, we could request all the ancillary stuff too, but typically what has happened is that uh, utilizes an awful lot of the budget for instance I not guess, yes it does not Almost. this year uh, mm -hmm. because the ROT has grown so much over the past years but essentially three four years ago uh, the lifeguard budget for personnel and salaries ate up almost 80 percent of the room occupancy tax activity money oh, so right. we limited it mm -hmm. to just the personnel and benefits the big stuff um, could we put in all of this? Certainly you could, but we're also looking at utilizing the ROT funds for uh, the chamber, right. for CBDI, for parks and rec, for the activities, and also for bathroom things. So you get to pick and choose which things you want to put into that dollar value. Oh, right. Yeah, I was just looking at a $128,000 increase um, for lifeguards in this budget. And part of that is is the capital item, and that that's the one thing that you'll see over and over again is whenever we replace vehicles or existing f stock of anything, that goes in that capital line item, and that tends to be where our budget gets high. The personnel and benefits are relatively small. I'm going to say it's pit basically under a 6% increase each year, depending on how council chooses to award uh, their uh, employees and then the m and o is usually pretty light i mean uh, we've done a awful lot trying to hone in on the operational costs so what you end up with is just that capital cost being a large factor of it so these rollover numbers again like back in 16 17 was 110 that goes back to the general fund i assume none of that was rot i mean i'm seeing 73,000 um difference in 1718 projected if you don't mind pointing me to where you're looking I'm just at, looking at this she's head. looking at the expense general breakout right the the handout that you gave with this yes. budget. yes she's looking at the uh, general fund lifeguards page she's I'm comparing 16 17 with 17 18 and um, the amount that was budgeted versus what was spent and I believe what happens when you guys look at those numbers is that's the gap that he doesn't require to spend out of um, general fund. When they well, come in short like that, 
what we'll what happens is or... is when you come in short like that, typically we've had problems hiring guards or we've had a big turnover in no, guards. What she's talking about is Michael, when you budget um, four fifty and you only spend um, three eighty, but that's only through the year. Uh, if you look at this one where we budgeted four fifty and you spent three forty, the hundred hundred and ten thousand dollars that wasn't spent goes back into fund balance. So what happens is when he budgets the two million gap that's required out of fund balance. Now he only needs a million nine to make that gap, and then the other department subtracts, and so that's how he gets from two million gap to a million. Um, so he takes I'm just all those. I understand the dynamics. Of yes, ma'am. Right. So my my Philosophy. question for you, Mike, Michael, is um, on the revenue side. When we talk primarily, and we'll get the. I, I had no questions for for fire. I don't want to keep Alan. I mean, so okay. I'm, but my, my issue was, job. Michael, on the revenue side, which we'll get to down the road, you um, you showed occupancy tax in sixteen seventeen of six hundred, and we actually brought in six sixty eight. This year you budgeted six hundred, and you say we're only going to bring in six hundred, and next year you budgeted six ten. I'm looking at the um, activity dollars available in ROT, and depending on how you read the number, we're well over six hundred. Be. Yes. So You're that's correct. another one of those gap revenue issues. Is that well, what I'm it, understanding? It's, it's a gap revenue, and it's a difference in year to year what is left. So, for instance, if ROT last year brought in more money than what we budgeted, then we will end up having a surplus in the ROT funds for that. We don't go out usually the next year and say, ooh, we're going to spend all that money over here. Uh, well, we, we but we can. We, we're gonna, least, we want to do the same thing we've asked you over the last couple of years, which is tighten that up a little. Yes. Because I'm looking at the budget she gave us yesterday. We have seven hundred eighty-nine thousand dollars available budget in activity dollars. Yes. And when our fire department tells us that we're raising our ocean costs to five hundred eight thousand dollars, I mean we're up by fifty. I'm just saying let's start being more aggressive. Whether we're spending it on bathrooms at Hamlet or we're spending it on lifeguard pay, let's start spending that down. <coughs> yes. Put it in the mix. Have, you, but you budgeted six ten, and I'm telling you, in seventeen we had six sixty eight come in. This year we're going to be well above six hundred. So squeeze that gap a little by going above six ten. Your call. Not uh, a that's problem. The, when we get to your part of the budget where it talks about revenue, that's what I'm going to ask you to. And I got, understand got that. Got that on my agenda already. Yes, sir. And I'd like to see. I think Joe and I would love to make a presentation to TDA asking for funds to expand that Hamlet Avenue area. Well, we can do that. That's what, defensible. Once we get to a point in the budget where we think we have a good right, solid plan for the ROT funds, today. my thought is that we have y'all present that to TDA yeah, for the next year. I think we should probably look at pretty quick about having something drawn up for that facility. Sunshine, Do we own the lot? We don't own the lot beside it. We just lease that? The lot beside the, the lot. Hamlet lot, we oh, lease all of that except for the area where Tony Savani has his, uh, okay. his shop. Um, next one is police. Um, you'll notice that uh, in the police budget, um, it's broken up into two different accounts, uh, similar to the fire department where we have fire and lifeguards. Uh, police department is in our 510, our base uh, police budget, and then we also have some in beach maintenance, which is traditionally our Freeman Park account. So um, I'll uh, let the chief go through his uh, presentation with you, and then you can ask questions as you go along. Whoop. It's all yours, chief. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for allowing us the opportunity to present the police budget and the 630 budget, the beach maintenance budget, for the 2018-19 budget cycle. Uh, the, both of these budgets were driven for calls for service uh, and service for, for the community, particularly the 630 for our, um, our council meeting from January. We had a full house, and we'll get into that a little bit later when we hit that budget, but it was request for, for citizens and also uh, some of the conversations between council and the citizens. We start off with our org chart. Uh, the reason that we're hit hard on this this year is because the wages and salary is what takes up the majority of our, our police budget. 
This is our, our current org chart, and I want to draw your attention to the three areas that are not shaded. The one on the be uh, below there that says Beach Patrol Division, that will be discussed later in the 630. Uh, this is um, our, current, our current level where we are right now, and this is what we're requesting. As you see, our, um, we're asking for one position, which uh, like uh, Chief Griffin, is to kind of take some of the stress off of the shoulders of what we've got right now with some of our admin staff. Also, a lot of our sergeants are performing um, a bunch of tasks that we could share the load and reassign some of the workload for uh, what we'd like to have as a, a deputy chief. Uh, there's three areas we need to improve on, um, and, and the deputy chief would help that, is their reassessment and assignment of workloads. Also, recruitment and retention has been a huge battle for police departments, particularly over the last two or three years. As we move through this presentation, I want you to keep in mind that in the last two or three years, we have not had a full roster of uh, personnel. Either it's issues with recruitment and retention. And there's been some discussion about retention over the past few council meetings. Uh, we find that people are moving to other areas, interested in other parts of law enforcement. They're interested in other departments. There are a couple of officers that are relocating for urgent family matters. One of those is going to occur in the next six weeks. So he's going ahead and give us a heads up. Um, right now, we're not at, at full staff. We've got about three openings. So as we move through this, I want you to keep in mind that just because you see a, a, a position there, that does not mean there's a, an able body uh, getting paid uh, wages or, or benefits through that yet. The, the only thing between this one and the last one, uh, last year's is a little bit different, is we did request a sergeant detective position but not personnel. We're going to fill this position within that unit as well, so that will not be an extra body, just an uh, enhanced position. This is an outlay of personnel and benefits. Uh, you'll be able to compare last year's with this year's. The main notice, uh, this is all generated, uh, as Michael said, from, from him and from uh, Human Resources, wow. is the staffing of the additional person. Uh, highlights from last year were the request of two full-time patrol officers and one criminal, uh, criminal investi investigative detective. We have yet to fill that detective's position. That's still open. Um, that's what will be encompassed into the new sergeant's detective position. And our so then, Chief, out, out of that 2.3, what you're saying is because you didn't fill some of those positions, that number's going to come in as an actual less than that? Okay, and so that would... And those, and those funds roll into fund balance. Right, but you so still have to budget for that. So we have to budget like we, we have 36 position, right? warm bodies there. Chief, can you, um, did, uh, Michael, I should know this, and I apologize for not... Did we change our 401 match program over the last year and a half? Uh, actually, uh, two years ago, we didn't have a 401k right. match. Last right. year, we decided not to do a COLA, uh, but add in a 401k okay. match. This year, I'm recommending that we go up by another percent on that 401k match. Okay. So that's why, in this case, you see that the 401k match, uh, mm -hmm. it seems very skewed. Well, ju yeah, jump from zero to 50. I mean, yeah. I think it's wonderful that we're... Um, Offering a 401 on the retention to keep our people in place. Currently, um, most other communities that have, that we benchmark against are doing a 5% 401k match. We, like I said, two years ago had none. So what so are we we've at been now? doing? Uh, well, this year we're at 1%. Next year, uh, for this budget, I'm talking about going to 2%, and then doing that ratcheting that, up every year. Is that two two percent uh, reflected in that 50 number? Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. Councilman Schroeder would thank you for pointing that out. As we move through this uh, this presentation, the numbers on the left, the 17, 18, those I pulled from last year's budget book, so that was what is approved. That doesn't necessarily reflect what is accurate for this day. Right. Right. I'm sure Michael could make those available to you if need be. <clears throat> Our M and O uh, from last year, the highlights were the. Uh, the radio upgrade, and as uh, Chief Griffin pointed out, this is our third and final year on that. Uh, we did increase uh, travel and training for tactical training, officer survival, professional development, and management, 
At this time, right now, as we speak, we've got 36 police officers that are being hosted um, by the fire department. Thank you again for the use of your facility for a spinoff of the FBI National Academy that's uh, kind of National Academy light on the road. And we have hosted two sessions. This is our second. We're doing that quarterly and getting our um, officers involved in that and getting exposure to some leadership, uh, supervisor, uh, and mentoring um, tactics. We're also uh, have our next phase for the town government uh, camera, which is to include some door access access systems. I know the mayor and I have done a, a walkthrough and looked at some of those uh, challenges we have right now. Yep. And the last is a Tsunami 360 camera. These are not for sale. They're only available by lease. But this is a, a camera that is weatherproof and tamper-proof, and we can deploy that at many locations to capture any type of video we may need. So we could use it at the bridge. We could use it at the... The marina, we could use it at the lake. Um, it's a versatile piece of equipment that a lot of beach communities use, and I believe Curie Beach actually has too. This is a list of our capital improvements. Last year, as you see, uh, 17 18, we didn't have any uh, capital improvements laid out. This year, we're looking at replacing um, one vehicle with a Dodge Charger and replacing another vehicle with a Dodge Durango. The figures you have there are bought on the state contract at a reduced rate, and that these numbers do include fully upfitted with all the emergency equipment and computers. One thing to note about um, the police department capital, um, several years ago we started replacing uh, all of the older vehicles that we had that were hand-me-downs from the state um, and from other departments and we rolled out all new vehicles over a three-year time frame last year we had none this year there were only a few vehicles that were left that we didn't replace in that rollover because the age and the and the uh, uh, capabilities of the vehicle weren't to that age yet uh, this year this is the last two vehicles that will kind of be rolling out in this now that doesn't mean the next year you won't see a replacement of a couple of vehicles. It all depends on wear and tear, the length of time that we use vehicles and what our costs are being incurred on those vehicles. So uh, going from nothing to $70,000 or thereabouts for, for two vehicles for a fleet of almost 30 vehicles is too, too bad. Is it about the same amount to equip those vehicles, the 10,000 that the police or the fire chief just um, talked about, or is it more to? Basically, um, quite often what you'll find is one of the most expensive things is equipping them with the interior guards for, um, for the um, storage in the back. For instance, you know, you have to take out the seats and put in different seats, and you okay. have to have guards for the. So uh, maybe a little more. Yes, There's uh, but it's generally ten thousand dollars. Equipment and some of the fire equipment may have cameras on it, but there's some. There's they're very close. Um, th this is actually a kind of a, a total end of five ten um, for, for you to view. It shows last year's uh, budget and it shows the requested for this year with one full time uh, employee. I didn't put this in the presentation, but we we are seeking a non-paid intern at some point to assist with our front desk. Uh, the, the duties and responsibilities of our administrative assistant and our front uh, records person has increased tremendously. Uh, from a historical perspective, for those that haven't uh, been around the department uh, from 10 years ago, when I first started here, we had three administrative support staff that were non-sworn and we had six admin personnel that were sworn. In about 2005, we went to four admin personnel. And in 2007 or 8, we went to two or three support personnel, uh, two support personnel that worked uh, in the front. Uh, so it, it's about time to, to lift those numbers up a little bit to help support the rest of the organization. 
Are there any more questions regarding the 510 account for the police department? I just have a question. I'm not sure I'm in the right spot for it yet or not, but um, are any of the increase of your, uh, you know, we talked about increasing your personnel for Freeman Park and, yes, and, and that kind of thing. Is that part of this or not? That's going to be in the, the 630, the, the next part of the presentation. Okay, go ahead. Beach maintenance. I have a question too. That I'm going to go to the bathroom. Missed, I may have missed this when I walked out, so I apologize. Uh, in regards to the, you said we missed, we have a handful of vacant staff. Yes. And one of the things that jumps out at me is we're looking at possibly the, the, this current year, 30,000 in overtime, and next year, an extra 56. Would it then not make sense to be more competitive on that pricing and try to use that within the realm of paying more? Or it, that number is a huge increase. If I can give you a little bit of background and Chief chime in if, if I get something wrong here. One of the things that you'll find is in order to keep our full staffing low, we end up utilizing our officers in off-duty occasions to backfill. Okay. So, for instance, if you were to do a true what they call a manning chart for police and fire, what you'd be looking at is what's your requirement for number of officers, subtract out time off, holidays, weekends, whatever their time off schedule is, how much leave pay they get, um, and also any training, any time that they go to the court system, things like that that would take off of that. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, okay, in order for me to have five staff members at in the police department on staff riding the roads, we need actually seven people to backfill those times off. Okay. So that's where we do a lot of playing with the numbers to figure out how many staff do we actually need and how much can we get out of our employees by paying overtime for right. that. And it's just a give and take. Um, that 30000 yes, that's huge when you look at it, but when you look at just the salaries itself, uh, it's a small percentage of that. If we were to go in hire another full-time officer to compensate for that, you'd be looking at a $70,000 bill instead of a $30,000 overtime charge. Okay. So that's a give and take. Is that accurate, Chief? It is. And there's a, a, another slide or two um, in the beach maintenance which kind of touches and addresses some of that. You'll be able to see some figures that, uh, that point that out. And I also, I'm sorry, but I also missed the why and the clarification for the, uh, the deputy chief thing versus the two admins that are there. I didn't, I didn't hear that piece. I think I walked out on that. It's th there's there's a few reasons. One is because of the workload that we already have on the shoulders of our admin staff. We also have a workload on our sergeants that do ancillary projects. Uh, even though I'm, I can tell you right now, Sergeant Ward doesn't mind it because he does a really good job at it. He's a car guy. He manages our entire fleet. Okay. That is a huge responsibility. But that's the same mind that we need for critical thinking. We have critical incidents, reducing on liability. So while he may be able to manage that, there's some other areas that they still get compound, compounded on. And what we need is our, we need our sergeants to be street ready. They're, they're, some of, they're the most important people in our department when it comes to the street and the backbone of a, of a police department. He manages your what? I'm sorry, I missed. Our our, the police the fleet. The fleet. The fleet. Okay. Now, Wow, and we qualify job. that to make sure. <laughs> Just because he's good at it. It's, yeah. It walks hand in hand with, right. with Gil. We are, uh, because Gil is the overall fleet management. Uh, and Gil has seen these figures and, and it, uh, are vetted through him. Yeah. Um, but for our side, it's a, it's a huge responsibility on, on one of our sergeants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically similar to what I was saying about the Manning chart, the reason why the chief is asking for a deputy uh, chief position is so that he can take some of the administrative workload off of the other officers, house it in one position. That means you can put more of those people on staff duty out in the field. Okay. And that was that's really the intent to doing that. So I walked out. So I'm hearing you say that you have officers doing um, clerical work. Not necessarily well, clerical. I don't mean it like but, that, but you know what I'm saying, where you can have them out on the street somewhere. Yeah, they're, the streets. they're doing officers that in a typical police department would be certainly more and over than just concentrating on, on the street and, <clears throat> and managing Crime. subordinates. I mean, and safety. And, and an important part of this, uh, of the, the organizational chart that we're proposing, is recruitment and retention. 
Uh, we're a paramilitary structure, and I don't, I, as some may understand, the reason when you come into a department, you start looking at rank and structure so you can strategically position yourself at a certain area before you, at a certain grade before you retire, uh, plus you, you're there to make the organization better. And you know that the ideas and the leadership that you want to do is only represented at certain milestones. So this is absolutely a way that we can get good quality people in our police department. This is a, um, a chart that, oh, I'm sorry, let me skip back one. Uh, starting off with our 630 account for the uh, beach maintenance that uh, Councilwoman uh, Pierce was speaking about, this is where we're looking at the wages and salaries uh, f from last year and what we're projecting for 1819. Staff right now is at five and a half, which is the same thing as uh, five full-time, one part-time, correction, yeah, five full-time, one part-time, and we're looking at increase, increasing that to two and a half or two and a half time positions, which will give us a total of eight. The reason that I looked at this was, as we were all here in January, there was a full house and there was a lot of conversation. A lot of people came to the podium and expressed concerns about Freeman Park. The main things that I think we heard were that enforcement, 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 and trash, 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 trash. That was one of the big takeaways. I didn't get a chance to to interact with the, the, the citizens at that night, but enforcement does, doesn't mean pen to paper or handcuffs. Enforcement is being present, being visible. It's going up and telling just people, do you know about glass on the beach? It's not allowed. So there's the, the, the verbal interaction, the education component. Then from there on is a civil citation, a criminal citation, or arrest. So enforcement has many mm -hmm. phases. and I. I'm not sure that people in the community understood that we've almost probably tripled our civil citation um, in the last budget year, uh, last season, but we also talked to thousands and thousands of thousands of people in that season about doing educational and verbal warnings. So it's, uh, it's not lost on me that some of the frustration from, from the, the citizens is that they just don't understand all of the dynamics of what we do out there. This is a chart that would uh, depict what we currently have and what we're pro proposing. We did a survey of our Freeman Park officers and said in season, for a typical shift on a typical day, we're out there about 80% of the time. Reason being is because they're human, they need to take personal breaks, they need to eat, they need to hydrate. But at the end of the day, if you do end up making an arrest, you're off the sand for three to four hours. That's just the dynamics of what it would take to process a person. What that essentially means is that you're gonna pull a person off of the asphalt or doing urban policing in our community and putting them on the sand. That's not taking into account that we still have to prepare for a critical incident or for another rest on, on, on the asphalt or if something else happens on, on the beach. So this is a complete moving target. So that was the vision for doubling up um, the staff out there is that we'd have 24 hour coverage out there and always have backup uh, in case there was any incident that needed to be dealt with. If you look and you'll see. Chief, are you, sorry to interrupt. Sure. You're basically saying that the increase on Freeman Park represents a contingency for something elsewhere in town in a pinch. And to some degree, yes. Um, and as um, Councilwoman Pierce will probably echo some of the concerns from the um, Police Advisory Committee is that they don't necessarily want their tax dollars going to pay for a police that works the asphalt and our urban areas to be spent to go and spend time on Freeman Park where that's an entity that kind of pays for itself and is somewhat not necessarily self-sufficient but does generate funding for that. And from a police world, when we look at the police department, we look at Freeman Park, I almost think of it like two different cities or towns. The dynamics are completely different. The manpower is completely different. So there's some dynamics here that we just need to think about as, we're, as we, we walk through it. So if we take our statistics that we looked at and our percentages, we see that about 52.5% of the time, we actually have officers on the beach with our current levels. And this is seasonal. This is six, seven, eight months out of, this, out of the year. 
And then if we did increase it, we would have what would be potentially 105% of uh, on-duty officers on uh, Freeman Park. So this is, Mr. Garza, uh, another example of how to go and use the staff to backfill for those times off. That's why when you look at this chart at the, at the top portion and you say one officer out on that beach um, full time for the entire year is 2,184 hours. And then you look at how much time they're actually on the sand compared to off the sand and in what season. And when you calculate that all out, and you look at it, that one officer is really only spending 52% of their time on the sand. The other 47% is off the sand. So if you want to get to what we heard in January as we've got to have one person that's always out there on the sand, you have to have enough backfill to make it so you can get to that 100% mark for time and uh, manpower out on the sand at any given point in time. So that's almost Does like, that make that, that, sense? That's like yeah. saying it, 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 that's a two to make one. And, and, and yes, that's, that's very true. And like the chief yeah. said, a lot of that has to do with the, um, the arrests and things like that because it does take two to three hours once you arrest somebody and take them off the beach, that resource is moved off the, off the sand. Well, to that question, um, didn't we used to have a magistrate in Carolina Beach? When, I, when, I, when we first started here in, in 2000, mm -hmm. uh, up until about 2003, we had two magistrates that lived on the beach and they were assigned to just this office. So you had certain days, I remember that. And, and those dynamics have changed. Um, n now that those magistrates could very well be pulled to the city or the county to work the, the busy magistrate offices there. And they're typically on call at night. If, if we have an occurrence that happens during the day, we take them to the courthouse or straight to Blue Clay Road, which so is 20 the magistrates are paid by the county? I'm sorry? They're paid by the county? Yes. Or, okay. So we don't have any possibility of getting a one or part-time one in, in Carolina Beach in the summer, maybe? Or are there, I don't know how that works. Like, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that. I mean, are there retired people who would come back for part-time positions or? The dynamics have changed now that, that we're actually looking to do something more progressive and we've already set the wheels in motion with policy um, and implementation of going before a magistrate via video. Okay. So we don't know how it's going to look. It looks really good on paper, um, but until we work through it. But that saves you time. It sh in theory, it should save us time. That's the hope. Has that been approved through the county already? Yes, that's that's been oh, approved. Okay. And that that's part of the challenge is, a great idea. is when we move into needing the magistrate, that is no longer our responsibility and our budget. It is the sheriff's office I know. and I was their just budget. Thinking about options. Yeah, yeah. and so I think the the virtual magistrate aspect that the chief and the other departments are looking at will make it so we'll be able to process people faster down here but um, there's always some challenges with that and we won't really know until we get into it well actually virtual court for our officers would be huge for them as well certainly I would vote for it I've seen them in there after they got off a shift on their personal time in a courtroom I do want to point out, though, as we look at this diagram right here in the next one, when we have these conversations, we're assuming that all of our positions are full by able people and there's no vacancies. That's just not realistic. That was going to be my question. How many people, I, I got off on something else, but how many um, in, increased people are you talking about? Is that full-time or part-time to do the Freeman Park Beach Strand? Uh, they would be full-time, and it, for this budget, the, the coming up budget, we're requesting two and a half positions. So, Chief, can you back up one slide just to make sure I understand? Yes, sir. Basically, what you're saying is the increases that you're um, have budgeted based on what you um, heard at council would take us from 247 to 283. I mean, to 483. Is that? That's correct. Okay. And, Mr. Manager, am I correct in? hearing you say that the 247 has been paid in the past out of the Freeman Park gate fees? 
Yes, and then the proposal would then need to have the 483 coming out of the gate fees. Yes, one thing to so keep that would cut into our um, sand dollars. Uh, I would cut it would cut into the amount that we bring in in revenue for Freeman Park, which could cut into the sand dollars. Yes, which, sir. which right now we have we have um, we have revenue over expenses in Freeman Park. Some of that we're setting aside for sand dollars. Some of that we're setting aside into general fund. That's correct. Um, this would dramatically impact it's your 36. Um, one of those two. So so that, uh, Joe Dan, you were asking before, ad valorem. Okay. One point on the ad valorem tax is about two hundred and sixty five, two hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. So, so to supplement that loss or this overage would either be that money coming out of the general fund increasing the taxes or we wouldn't have the sand dollars the other thing that we've talked about using those sand dollars for is if we move on an acquisition of Freeman Park having a user pay so all that being said what I really heard from the public was they didn't want to close the north end of the beach and so when we told them we were doing it for safety they kept saying hire more police hire more police I'm personally not going to support spending $240,000 more on police to police um, a stretch of sand. Uh, I would rather, I mean, especially since we have a problem filling those positions anyway. So, I mean, and, and I've suggested that to the chief. I appreciate these numbers. Being, which would end up being, to Steve's point, committed dollars that can't be applied elsewhere that would need a backfill possibly in taxes even uh, if we can't uh, fill those right positions, and i i, owe that I think michael's philosophy that he's been working with the chief on for the last couple of years which was that crawl walk run process has demonstrated that we've seen stronger enforcement out there um i mean honestly if we're going to spend another two hundred thousand dollars in police protection for the community i'd rather see him in the community policing on Greenville and 7th Street and Magnolia and and right. our residents. So that's just me. I mean, so I just want to make sure I understood those numbers correctly. Yes. As a side note, the one thing that isn't represented very well in this slide for 2017-18 to 2018-19 is the fact that we added that beach ranger and that halftime beach ranger position in last year but we had a very hard time filling those positions and keeping them on the beach. So the dollars associated to them really aren't represented in here in 2017 because that is actual how much we actually had put out for that over this year. Whereas the four eight, the $480,000 includes saying you have, you know, eight beach people and they do nothing but the beach and that includes those one and a half so yes it's it's a little bit deceiving it may not be I guess my point is it may not be the total difference the 240 but it's right around that two hundred dollar two hundred thousand dollar threshold yes I, I agree with Steve um, I, I hate to say that I mean I don't mean I hate to say I agree with Steve but I hate it for your budget that it's just it continues to increase something that we we've got to fix now I welcome your input and insight right. that's that's what we I need. mean and I don't know how that's going to shake out yet in the end yeah I, I'd rather focus on helping him with officer retention right. and filling vacancies All right I don't know how you're gonna fill two additional when you're short staffed now and we still haven't got the beach patrol what I feel like is really hammered down into a good system I guess I would ask chief from a service coverage as the professional providing it at this point given the current model that we've had for the last couple of years are you satisfied or are we covering Freeman Park with appropriate um, police protection like I think uh, Councilman Pierce just uh, mentioned that we haven't had time to really enhance the we'll call it beach ranger but what we did is we just absorbed that to a police officer and a part-time police officer mm -hmm. so I don't think we that was that happened just real quick in the middle of the season last year having to recruit for that then having to train for that here you're already in the fall so the way that the timeline the milestones meet for that is just not something you can do overnight it takes two or three months we're in a position where we can do that now because we've we've assumed and absorbed that position also, uh, Michael's been working on an enhanced 
citation platform that should have consistency from where you're actually interacting with a person right off the get-go that it turns into a digital format. Could you, would you mind speaking on that a little bit? Sure. One of the things that um, we've been trying to do is get our officers to be able to write citations out in the field on a handheld, say on their cell phone, whatever the case may be, and print out a citation right then and there and hand it to somebody. Because currently the system is you write it out on a paper ticket book, you give them a copy, you take the ticket book back to the office, somebody types everything in that you, that you had there. There's additional work and steps involved in That's that. Awesome. Um, we've had a difficult time finding products that meet our need for civil citations. <coughs> There's some that are specifically police. There are others that are specifically code enforcement, but there's nothing that sort of covers all civil citations, which Freeman Park stuff is civil. It's not necessarily police. We finally found a product, and we'll be unveiling this um, hopefully in the next uh, month, where the officers will be able to download a uh, app on their phone, and when they're out there in the field, if they have a $500 printer on their hip, they can write a civil citation, print it out, and hand it to them. Cuts out all the middleman stuff, and it also processes uh, invoices so that if somebody misses a payment or they didn't pay it in 14 days and they now get a penalty associated to non-payment, it sends them a letter. Currently, we have none of that. So we do citations that go into a black hole and some get paid, some don't. And we're really not reaching out to them saying, look, we were serious, you need to pay this. So with this process, I think what you'll see is you'll see the mm -hmm. officers being able to write tickets easier, thus they'll write more tickets and do increased enforcement. Um, to Councilman Shuttleworth's uh, comment, mm -hmm. we honestly believe that if we did nothing more than in Improve our beach ranger program where instead of having a half position where it's a part-time person that does police work that's not easy to fill if we did nothing more than fill that position as a one full position then you would have good coverage for the year on Freeman Park and the beach strand along with this increased enforcement tool where we could continue to ramp up our enforcement and educate people that means that you wouldn't necessarily need the additional two bodies in Freeman Park. That also keep in mind that those two new bodies need two new vehicles, and that's another one of the parts of the equation is beach maintenance has two vehicles associated to it because we're adding two people. So we got to get them out there on the beach. I would rather see a budget presentation that, um, not not to you, but to that that incorporated exactly what you're talking about. I would I would prefer to invest in that kind of uh, more efficiency than more people that we can't fill positions for now. And like you just pointed out, a beach ranger would need a four wheeler, not a forty thousand dollar vehicle. You know, which is a huge difference. And if you did the beach ranger program much like the lifeguard program where maybe there's a head beach ranger and then he has people under him, which is under you, that and makes that, more sense. That was part of the vision was a, a beach. And what we might want to do is going forward, since we're talking about um, there will be sworn law enforcement officers working it, is we'll call them beach patrol officers um, and maybe let the, the ranger side of it uh, drift off into the past. Well, but yeah, whatever those works those you. those beach patrol officers will be making arrests, and they have to transport them in a secured vehicle with cameras, um, uh, like a traditional police vehicle, which we have now. And I guess that was my real question, Chris. Was currently are we in a re reactionary mode, or are, are we fortunate enough to still be on a patrol mode? In other words, are we having to race guys out there because there's an incident that we need to respond to? Other than the access problem. I mean, is there a life-threatening issue that we're not addressing by having enough patrol coverage? No, I, I, th I think you're exactly right. The police deal in two houses. It's quality of life and health and safety. I think when we do talk about nuisances in Freeman Park, we're talking about quality of life for the campers that are out there. Um, so, no, I would not, I'm not saying this is a five alarm. Uh, I think we can work through it. And some of the uh, information and data we've been getting is more recent than the than uh, 
I started forecasting this, but this predominantly is in reaction to citizen concerns from uh, from January's workshop uh, council meeting. So I have a question, a little bit of clarification here. That 247 is paid out premium park, and that's for full full times and one half time employee, correct? Yes. Dedicated strictly to Freeman Park. Not all. The, they also you. They also uh, manage the municipal strand. So then, ultimately, that pay that it's coming out of Freeman Park isn't paying for five full time, one half time dedicated to North End. It's paying to North End with a percentage of asphalt. Yes. Yes, that would be correct. Yes. <laughs> the and percentage so, of asphalt, though, I think, really, what is it, it's covering the beach. Well, that's what I'm trying to get to what it, Steve was it's talking beach about. Beach to beach. You didn't let me finish. Give me a second. <clears throat> uh, so what I was trying to get to is like Steve said is. If that five full timers and that one part timer is still able to do what we feel is needed for that north end, then those other positions may not be needed at that capacity. As Tori Leanne said, maybe then we step it down to okay, cool, we do the speech patrol, we get four wheelers, we save that because I have a hard time biting 240 grand as well as Steve. But if it's one of those things that five and a half can't control that north end from what our residents want. Yeah, we keep that five and a half when we look at, okay, maybe one, think of a different program that we put into play. Uh, I, I totally understand if we have to go into that motion of arresting somebody, we have those other guys say, okay, cool, and I met that call, you pull in, you grab this guy. But 240 is definitely a big bullet. That's why I agree with Steve and Leanne, as you're trying to get that clarification in case people ask us. Because okay. someone's going to say, hey, we spoke <laughs> about this, and we can justify that defensive side and say, okay, this is the reason that we're looking into this. Yeah, uh, keep, keep in mind that in the off season, we may have a patrol, you know, one person that drives out on the beach and looks around and keeps track of the beach, but they're not 100% on that beach. Yeah. If that's what, and that's what we heard communicated in January is we want 100% of somebody on the beach. Time. So in order to do that, that's how the chief came up with, I need to have a patrol sergeant, I need to have one full-time body. I need to have this half person to be able to get to eight so that we would have one full-time body on, on that. If that is not the intent or the appetite for council, no, we don't believe that it's necessary to keep the peace on Freeman Park. It is necessary to go and react to what we heard at council having right. one full-time and, and my question there. would be what would you do with those officers in the off season i mean i don't uh, know that we they, need them. I've, I've got that in the next slide and, uh, okay and but before you go to that slide to, i have oh, sorry go ahead go, no no go ahead i mean it that's what's that's on the next to, slide that's fine if to, uh, you got the spot for them to but I, I operate know, under two different budgets do you and the fire department communicate on your radios yes okay so you can talk to each other because i see a lot of fire Fire. I mean, I, I'm trying to figure. I see operations out there. I see fire there and on the beach strand and police. So if a fireman sees something, he radios to your police officers. <clears throat> Y'all need to come down here and check this out. More than likely, it's uh, the lifeguards do an awesome job of seeing and forecasting a problem, and uh, and letting uh, Chad know. And then so Chad between communicates. the two departments, there's eyes on the beach all the time. For sure. That's what I want the public to understand because when I'm out there, I always see either the police department or the fire department or operations could also call and say hey y'all might want to come check out this and situation. that happens constantly having eyes on the beach is what directs the calls to the police department so they can strategically send somebody out to the that location to get them or to deal with the the issue so yes it's a force multiplier to have lifeguards fire ops folks people out there where they can see it and radio into the police department and and just to compliment your officers when we were out there last weekend we were picking up trash and i think just talking to these people makes a huge difference they'd see us picking up trash they thought we were on community service which is fine <laughs> and um, i said no this isn't community services and they and, and we just said things like well hope you guys clean up your campsite please do that for us but one of the people who were already drinking pretty heavy first thing in the morning said the cops came by at one o'clock and told them to pipe down or they'd make them leave he said they were very nice. They spoke to us, and we cleaned up, quieted down. And so they are out there at one o'clock in the morning. I've yes, heard that from a camper. Good. That's good news to hear. I appreciate that. Um, as I was saying, it's it's hard to uh, to operate personnel in two different budgets because they're two different pots you're pulling from. But at the end of the day, you're still trying to fill the same need for service, whether it be sand or whether it be in the urban area, and that's what the next slide 
um, indicates. What we did is uh, we coordinated with um, human resources and, and payroll and got some statistics. And between the 510 police and the 630 uh, beach maintenance, when we look at vacation, sick, when they're using comp time, and we've projected court training, on an average, we use about just a little over 8,000 manpower hours where an officer's gone. So in retrospect, that's almost four positions when we talk about that many hours. So it's just food for thought. And at the end of the day, I got to chime in there. That's if we have a full roster of able-bodied officers working. This is the org chart that we uh, were projecting for the 1718, um, and I just try to draw your attention down to the bottom that says uh, this, this is where we are currently at 5.5 and what we'd like for the 1819. Uh, but I, I have heard your comments, and I appreciate them with your concerns regarding that. So what you see in the red are the things that from this budget the chief was asking for, and that is the deputy chief position uh, for recruitment and retention, <coughs> and then a sergeant uh, for the beach, and one and a half beach officers on top of what was already budgeted. Um, and that gets you that coverage that we talked about, having one live body on, on the beach at all times. What we heard here is come up with something else. You may not need all that. We're not willing to bite off that much money right now. Um, I think uh, the chief and I have talked about some other ways of doing things, and we can come back with a revised on that. I really think that half position <clears throat> needs to go away, and it needs to be a full-time position. If we did nothing more than that half, we might be well on our way to doing what, what you're looking for. Right. So Sorry. that would be sort of the next step would be me bringing that back to you later on. And this is the uh, the M and O for that account, which um, would include the uh, the uniforms and supplies, and that's been moved over to the 510. It was just uh, very cumbersome to try and work through that between between two budgets. And our capital improvements, which would include those vehicles fully outfitted with the uh, with the computers. And these are our totals for the 630 from 1718 to 1819. And as you see, it's two and a half full time employees uh, with an increase of a bite of almost 300. And, well, you get it, 312 grand. Chris, I appreciate you taking all the time to put that part of the budget together, but uh, I'm. I really think what we heard from the public was when we started talking about closing that north end, it was because we said there's trash, there's problems, it's access. And the answer from the public was you need to hire more police officers, you need to have more trash pickup. Um, I think what our officers have told us is we don't necessarily need more officers. We may do something on operations to pick up more trash. Um, I just, but that's, you know, we can get through that in the budget cycle here, Michael. And, and we have done that already uh, with the trash. Uh, we've added the additional person, and they already have started um, with that process. So we've made improvements there. I think we can make other improvements in the in the police area. The rest of the budget I thought looked great. And move along. There's there's just one final comment I didn't get a chance to mention. I, I just want to let you know that when we are thinking about administrative staff in the police area, that in the next 20 months to four and a half years, we're going to be losing about 110 years of all administrative staff likely. So now's the time to start thinking about that and forecasting that. And strategically, a, a, a deputy chief is somebody that can grab the hand of where we are now and grab the hand of those that are looking to aspire in those positions and get us across that bridge for the future. Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate so it. Do you anticipate being able to fill those positions before the season, the ones you have empty now? We have conditional officers out, 
conditional offers that have been accepted. Okay. So we're working through that. That's that's a that's about a two month process. Okay. Any more questions? Now, I hate chief just to uh, uh, basically repeat what Steve was saying. I like the efforts made in, in retention and talent management and more money towards 401k matching and, and other such programs at the expense of going after additional positions when there's three existing vacancies. Um, so that's great. The fact that you're the police chief now after 20 years in the force is, is in my mind, talent management and retention together. So good step. One question, and I could have asked Alan too. You guys, and I asked this before, <clears throat> months ago actually. Um, UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, to assist in policing. Is that something, I think you got three, Alan, a couple guys trained or something. Depending on wind conditions and. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. as a pilot of one of those. That, yeah, that's, that's, that's the way the technology's moving. Right. Because uh, it's, it's a force multiplier. Hot air balloons. Because it made, it made me think of it when you said issuing citations via an app. I can file a flight plan with my iPhone. On four flight. Get residents to send in the photos. Right, exactly. Anonymous text. So that's just something to consider. I think that's a nominal expense. but And then, Michael, last parting shot, the 630 account. Oh, question. Uh, for me, yeah, sorry, Jimmy. Um Maybe a stretch. ROT for patrol officers that are strictly hired for purposes of the beach, which is Activities. dealing with. Vacationers and is tied to Let's put everything in there. Right. I guess the stretch would be easily asked, better asked up at the TDA than in this forum. But I, I think that you could use your activity funds from ROT to support some level of police presence on Freeman Park and the Beach Strand as a tourist activity, activity. yes. That's it hasn't been traditionally done that way because of the complexities of, as the chief and I talked about, you know, what's on the sand time, what's off the sand time, and all that kind of stuff. But, but the you could do that. The offset for that, Michael, is as long as you're applying for the available ROT dollars that come out of the, they they augment the general fund. Why not? Whether you apply it directly to whether the justification is for police officers or it's 100 percent of lifeguards and a um, bathroom at Hamlet, as long as we're drawing down the ROT activity, uh, activity dollars, then that, that comes, that, that's relief to the general fund. It's, yes. It's, and it's defensible, I think, in the end. Certainly. Right. Certainly. <laughs> and you just need to make that case, and we need to put it out there. Uh, my, I have a random question off the side from this is that each department ultimately is a maintenance repair replacement on vehicles and roughly 200 grand. Do we have a line item? in our typical budget that says, hey, every year we put X amount of dollars into this, so that way they're not asking, but we have something we're pulling from, knowing no. how many vehicles we're going through? Uh, we don't. Um, <clears throat> basically, what we've done is we've paid it as you go. Um, about four or five years ago, it was we don't do any replacement, and we just had very old equipment. Um, each year we've gone in and said we need to pay as you go a little bit and put that money into replacement of vehicles. Um, at one point there was a capital improvement fund that the town used in that capacity. That kind of went away before I got here and I haven't reinvented that. There's several things you can do for that. Um, you can go and have money budgeted each year that you pull out and set repair, over to the side. Um, that tends to mean that you need to have an investment up front. So if our investment every year is we have to do 200000 that means another 200000 needs to be added to the budget so that next year we don't have to worry about that. Um, you could also go and do loans for capital replacement stuff. Which you we don't go currently do. Um, I'm going next you know, tough. Going long through long the budget, you'll see that we have, let's say, five hundred thousand dollars with the vehicle replacement stuff in the general fund. Um, well, I could go out and get a loan for five hundred thousand dollars for this year and spread it out over three years. Okay, I could, or I could pay it as you go. That's a that's the policy decision that really council needs to make. And then yes, we could tweak the program so you do things like that. Um, there's pros and cons to both ways. 
so basically Michael, we're doing um, pay as you go along those lines of, as far as vehicles you know um the budgets that the capital improvement plan package that you sent us had seven hundred and some thousand dollars of capital improvement 560 of it was vehicles you got 11 vehicles a backhoe a tractor and two four-wheelers and then the utility guys had two trucks and a dump truck um, when you start talking 11 12 13 trucks or vehicles does it make sense instead of going to the government site to go to a vehicle broker I mean go to a dealership and ask them we're buying a fleet we uh, I'm just asking you if I understand some of these are specialty upfits the police officer has a different upfit than than the ocean rescue and I understand the upfit part but the base vehicle uh, I'm not setting I'm not including the backhoe or the tractor or the four wheelers but I mean can we go to a vehicle broker and just I mean when you we, start buying 11 12 13 trucks or cars we actually do that now and what we find okay. what we what we find right now is that the state um, contract cost is still cheaper than what we can get a vehicle for but at various points in times we have went and not used a state contract and gone with a local vendor because of that well I guess the other um, question I have is can it, it, and some of these low-use vehicles because we're only as DA Lewis rest his soul would remind us we're only a mile wide and three miles long you got a 70,000 miles on a truck can we go buy some used trucks because 24 27 thousand dollars you can and we've actually done that. And, and I, I don't want to make I it seem that, like <clears throat> what we're always doing is asking for new. Quite often what we're asking for is money to replace an older vehicle with a used vehicle that we get from a dealership. All right, but the capital improvement plan that you gave us had 300 and four, 500 and some thousand, 340 of it was trucks, and, and they were at twenty four, twenty seven thousand dollars 27000 Okay, and those are for... Planning department that was for parks and recs. That's not a specialty vehicle for the police or the fire or um, and It's not the dump truck. So I'm just telling you I, I'm hoping you can find some $13,000 trucks out there when you're buying ten of them. And I guess where I'm going is yes, sir We put that out there as a new vehicle and we work to try and make it so we have yeah. less expenditures And Michael it. to Steve's point. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense Steve to take 11 <laughs> proposed vehicles and to some even if it's a local dealership just to see if they're will uh, you don't even know what I mean I don't know whether you do or not but we don't know what they might be willing to do and then we can compare it back to the government they might say yeah we have 12 used Ford whatever's you know instead of this I, mean, I know they're going to try to make or as much as deal. they can too but that's 12 vehicles. And, and and please understand my point is yes we understand that and we do that if we can get a deal like that, we get it. Okay, so please understand my question is we don't know that unless you tell us that, and we don't hear that unless we ask that. And so when we have a capital improvement budget that comes before us for $700,000 that lists 11 vehicles at a number, we need that, I, I just, I'm, I'm just asking. The other question, Michael, that I have before we get out of here is on your revenue projections. Because I have no problem with the budgets that these guys are asking for. This is me. I'm looking at your revenue projections, and, and the one that you gave us, it shows an annual and approved budget and a full year's actuals for 16, 17, and then 17, 18, and an estimate. And w when I look at the budget for 17, 18, it was $15,808,000. And I go down line by line, line by line by line, and it shows the estimate is higher in quite a few of those, or, or the estimate comes in at 15, 8. But when I add the estimate up, it comes in at 18 million seven hundred so I'm not sure why the um, Excel spreadsheet didn't total on that line item of total revenue at 15 8 why it didn't pick up the other three million dollars I had um, the same issue pop okay, up when so I started reviewing things so when I look at that we're aware of that it, it shows an estimate well the, the drama there is it, it shows a budget of 15 8 and if I add it up you're showing that we're actually going to bring in 18 7 which includes the 2.1 uh, budgeted general fund transfer if I take out the general fund transfer it still shows a gross revenue of 16 6 which means instead of 2.1 out of the general fund we could potentially be adding back a million eight Plus, yeah. so we'd have a four million dollar swing so I'm just asking you at some point can you give us an update and, and review those and, and and did if you looked at those did I miss something or uh, Is that kind of the number no, you're you, looking at? You, you hit it right on the head. There's a couple of calculation errors that we've caught once we printed it out and started going through line by line to make sure everything added up. 
Uh, we've corrected well, a couple. Well, it's an Excel spreadsheet, so I don't know why it wouldn't it's auto not, add. It, it's okay. Maybe it's not. Is, the, my other question is on your sixteen Excel's seventeen you budget that. and actuals on sixteen and seventeen. It shows our budget was fourteen six, and the actuals came in at thirteen. And I show where you didn't include, you know, where, where the actual didn't have the million dollar general fund transfer. Um, but when I start looking at each one of those actuals in sixteen seventeen. They're dramatically less than what you budgeted. So I, I was curious, did we force you to that? budget too low? So you and I can talk offline. I don't need to take everyone. I'm just curious as to why on the budget, you know, we had parking lot collection. You budgeted 640, but you brought in 550. Um, but still, we hit our numbers. So I was just curious as to how those, is it, you're saying this is not an Excel spreadsheet? It is pulled from our budget, our financial software put into an Excel spreadsheet. What we find is that that communication between the two, we're losing valuable formatting information and that's creating a problem. So we're trying to okay. get that right. trying to we get that time. fixed. Good news um, is only March, April. Well, we and and keep in mind what typically happens in the budget is we have the departments, the large departments come meet with you to talk about their particular budget like today. Next budget workshop, it'll be all Gill all the time. I get the la the second the second uh, workshop after that will be me going through things like the revenue stuff and any updated information we have on it, and then we'll have a lot more dialogue like that. So, so I understand where you're historically from, yes, we have not really cut back the budget <coughs> request. We have yeah. really looked at how do we gap it. And how close are we on revenues? That's correct. So my focus was on your revenue sheet, and sooner rather than later, we probably ought to have that updated. Because I don't know if you guys looked at that, but when you actually do the calculations, yeah. if if Debbie, if you see no reason why your you, end of year estimate would not be correct, we'll actually be adding three two million dollars to the fund. That's not correct. That's the thing is the ad valorem tax <coughs> item that was in there overinflated it for the end of the year and said we were going to bring in an additional $2 million. Just not going to happen. Okay. So <laughs> it the good just, news is then we don't need to do the 2.1 transfer and we're a break even. We're not putting anything well, in the fund. but we're I'm not, not going to commit to any number until I see it. Until yes, June sir. 30th? <laughs> My concern, Michael, is to Steve's detailed point, the general point is if every department continues to increase in their budget and we don't increase revenues, it's got to come to a head somewhere and you've got to service that debt. So how yes. do we service that debt? As quickly as possible. Raise taxes. Well, maybe not. no. Well, we got we, we got to talk about how where we can cut things. And and yes, you're you're correct that every year things go up. And yes, the end result is you either have to trim back some of the things that you're doing for services, or you have to increase taxes or some other way of bringing in additional revenue. You're absolutely okay. right, or so, a combination of both. So, Michael, if you would provide us. A 14, 15, uh, 15, 16, 17 by department number of employees and the same for vehicles. I'm not suggesting any changes. I just want us to clearly understand that we've gone from 90 employees to how many do we have today, Michael? 115, 108. Uh, 116 and some change. Right. So when you, add, equivalent. when you add 26 employees or 20 employees, um, and there's no way around the revenue, I mean, the costs go up. And and please keep in mind, this is council-approved additions. I, I got that. Well, it, it's not it's like not. myself so or the town fault. staff are the ones doing it. Now it's it. our fault that we can't. They, yeah. they, okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, we'll, we'll make sure to remember that in this budget. Not our fault. When we cut them, then you can go do. tell them why. It's y'all's fault. And, and I, ha I have no problem with that. That That is. So, well, well, hold on, hold on. So I hear the police, the police chief here saying that he has to have a police officer do his fleet maintenance when we have a lot of other staff and he don't have that guy he can't always have that guy on the street he needs more officers but we don't have anybody managing that clerical part of the fleet management but we we have to have somebody on our side that knows the details of our vehicles what the problem is no, with I them understand that and yeah. understand your vehicle needs yep. but how much time is that i, I don't know what Mike, michael has continued to point out is that we have increased the request for services and if we're going to provide services as a community to our public, we have to fund those through staff. So we have two choices. We have a couple of ways around that. One is we don't provide the services. Or, as we talked about this morning, we can have the motor vehicle department philosophy, which is take a number and wait a little longer. 
Okay, that's not something the councils over the past couple of years has been willing to do. We wanted a quicker response out of planning department. We wanted a quicker response. We want to make sure the police and the fire guys are, are the department's getting a lot more calls. We've asked for the service coverage. So you either take your medicine or we've got, you know, and I'm not saying staff cuts. I just want to have everyone be aware of, including the public, so that if we do get in that discussion, I don't want to raise taxes, but at some point, that's a where do we balance that's that? on the table i mean it, it always is on it the always, table that's right it's always on the table right so and they don't call you and say you raised our taxes they call us so if no they call me too i don't want to make it seem your like answer is you can talk ones. to council they approved it council I yeah, that's what you just said council approved it reach out you to know? yes ma'am well then don't get upset when council disapproves oh no no and, and that is actually part of the process that we i'll say this haven't done uh, a lot of Quite often over the past four years, we have been coming to you, hearing what council asked for in additional services, bringing it back to you, and council approves that. And each year there is a give and take, and we need more of that We're give and take. We're going to start taking more. And, th and that's, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> Except for to... Yeah. Two chiefs, see, right. Well, well I'll just. This has nothing to do with through. with the budget particularly, and I know you've given us this in va in, in I won't say vague in general terms over and over again. But if you could give me a very specific breakdown of what the services cost us at Freeman Park and what it would not cost us if we had no services, those are numbers that I think you and I are going to have to have with the kind of what all of us are working on. Uh, but we got to know what Freeman Park really cost us and what we really make. True to the penny. And how and, much comes and out of this these guys' budgets for that. And you're ac asking for actuals for past years what we've spent. Past Correct? Two to three years. Yes, Michael, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make that assessment. Uh, and, we're, we're, and we're trying to I'm understand just, the cautionary issue of, of keeping the sand fund versus a potential acquisition where we would pay for it out of user fees versus just saying, we're done, give it back to the county, saying make it a state park, saying it's fine the way it is. Exactly. Saying All we're willing to zero it out and make. I'm looking for justification of what we need to make a decision on. The, re right. the reason why I asked about that is there's a big difference in what I give you between what we've spent in the past and what our budget is for the future. And that becomes quite often a difficult conversation. For instance, if we had four vacancies and we only spent last year half as much in personnel, well, we budget this year for the full personnel. I, I think so, we're looking for the, the true revenue and expenses for the last couple of years. And that's why I was As close asking, as you can nail it. And I can get you that. Right. That's okay. not a problem at all. And, and that goes to the, the overall Freeman Park discussion as much as well, Certainly it does. Certainly it does. And, and Mr. Mayor, that's going to tie into the ROT dollar exactly. amount, the advertising, the sand fund, and all those things we've talked about. So we get some ROTs to pay for us, some information requests. Okay. Yes. Okay. Anything there's else? Ju there's just one last thing that I wanted to, uh, yeah. when I talked about that two to five year forecast of our administrative staff, it's in our service contract it's about eight thousand dollars it's really a placeholder i'm not sure that we're going to be able to to manage that this year but i need to get it on the radar is that we have outgrown our department our structure physically will not hold us we have 12 people sharing offices and not that we don't we can't share offices but some of these are glorified closets that we've got two people and i know that the, the mayor's had an opportunity to walk over there so when we think about three, four, five years down the road, I just wanted to uh, to make sure that that was on the radar uh, that we could have later discussions about it. New Town Hall. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks, and Chief. on that cheery note. Thanks for throwing that in at the tail end. All right. <laughs> Anything else, Michael? No, sir. Thank you. See everyone tomorrow. $2.1 million.